It was one cold morning in June, July of 1981 in Nairobi when a friend, Patrick Kibundu, who was at the Kenya School of Law, walked into my little apartment in the doctor's mess at Kenyatta National Hospital with John. I had never met John before and had no idea why they had come that early. John had arrived that morning from Uganda. Patrick went ahead to introduce us and state why he had brought John to my apartment. John had just escaped from Uganda, fearing for his life under the regime at the time. Some of us attending today will be familiar with this story. Patrick made sure to let me know that we might have different political convictions, but we all cared about our country's destiny and the need for, for, for to be there for each other. We then agreed to share our responsibility for supporting John to settle in. John had been robbed on arrival at the Akamba bus station and did not have any means of survival. Patrick would provide accommodation and I would provide meals while John found his way. We did not have to do this for a long as John quickly found his way around and got a job as a teacher at a private school downtown and found his own accommodation in his sleep. A one, bedroom, a one bedroom apartment as that is all he could afford. John was in a hurry to get his own place because he had left Pase in Uganda and wanted her to come and join him as quickly as possible. They were expecting a baby and he could not imagine not being there for the birth of their first child. Within about 12 months, John had established himself and moved to slightly bigger accommodation. Being the philanthropist, he was uh, taking his family role seriously. John started bringing over his brothers and family members from Uganda, providing them opportunities that they would not have had, and quickly filling up his new home. At about the same time, I had completed my internship and had to move out of the doctor's mess. John found me a room on the same block where he was living, and I became part of the family. John insisted that I do not cook in my room and that I should have all meals with the family. He also did not expect me to contribute to buying the food in the house. I remember him always going to Marikiti to buy sacks of Irish potatoes and green peas, which were the staple at the house, and maybe what he could afford to feed such a large family. The tables had switched from me providing him with meals to him feeding me. This has always reminded me that you never know what the future holds. That is the John I got to know. For many years, we shared the life of a brother and a friend. We did a lot together and were there for each other. I'll share just two scenarios to show you who John was to me. After Pasa had arrived in Nairobi and they needed to formalize their marriage, John asked me to be his best man and witness to their marriage, which I was honored to do. Later, when I needed to visit my future in-laws for introductions, it was payback time, John became my parent. When my mother was ill and eventually passed away in Nairobi while I was away in the US, John took responsibility until I was able to travel back and ensure that we gave her a deserving funeral back in Uganda. Our greatest bond was based on mutual trust and respect, but most important in knowing that John would always tell me the truth, even when he knew it would hurt. Many of us will share our experiences with John, but I wanted to share this personal story to show you who John was, even when he did not have much to share. He was always a family man, a philanthropist, and truthful to his friends and four alike. May his soul rest in eternal peace and may the good Lord enable those of us still here to carry forward his legacy. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Opio Lawyer, Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University here in London, Ontario. 
I am truly humbled to say a few words at the inaugural uh, Professor John Tamarich's lecture. Now, there is so much to say about my brother John. Of course, the word brother is sometimes used loosely as a term of endearment. In my case, I might have come from Gulu and John from Ibanda, but we were truly brothers. I first met John, his wife, Pelusi, and two little children, Barbara and Brenda, in the spring of 1985 at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He had completed his Master's of Laws at the University of Nairobi and enrolled at Queen's Law in the PhD program. Now, the very first day we met in their modest little townhouse, John decided we were brothers, and that was that. There was no arguing about it. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing he would hide from me. Issues would be discussed in my presence. He told me without mentioning his words, for example, to settle down and get married. That was John. John had a very sharp mind and very little patience. When he loved you, and he loved a lot of people, he gave you his full attention. He pushed himself to extend research in international law, which he started in Kenya. But he also pushed his wife, Pelusi, to do a master's in education. The evening at John's apartment were transformed into long strategy sessions. You woman, he would say lovingly to Pelusi, where is your essay? And then he would turn to me, my brother, what about your project? How is it coming along? I credit John for encouraging me to get into graduate school. Well, to be very honest with you, it was more than encouragement. Okay, he just told me flat out, Opio, you need to do your master's now instead of two years later. Uh, when I protested, I protested that I needed money uh, first, he said, what money? I will work hard and I'll give you the money that you need. So the next day I borrowed this old Russian built ladder vehicle and drove two hours away to the University of Ottawa to pick up the application form for the master's program. Uh, in those days, there were no online application. So we spent the next couple of days completing the application and writing all the essays that were needed to go with the application. And so in the summer of 1986, uh, I was accepted in the master's program at the University of Ottawa. Of course, it paved the way later for my PhD. So that was pure John. He believed in education as the equalizer and was relentless in pushing his own family and extended family to get an education, to go higher. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we all gathered here today in uh, memory of uh, my dear friend John. Uh, John and I met at Macquarie University. We were in the same residence, uh, Livingstone Hall, and John was quite impactful in terms of uh, how he interacted with me and any other persons that uh, shared the vision that we did and um, what was most important is the fact that John had the vision of uh, having a united country in the sense that we did not look at uh, uh, people from ethnic point of view, we look at ourselves as Ugandans and that is why our bond became very strong and has remained very strong and that will always be the biggest impact in my life in seeing that uh, although we are from different ethnic groups, we share the same views and to me John is a brother to me and will always be a brother to me even in his uh, absence now. But uh, he lives through his uh, wife uh, Belusi, uh, his uh, three children and he has brought into the world people who will carry his memory and uh, excellent citizens for the country and for the world 
and we all uh, pray for his soul to rest and peace. We all miss him and we'll continue to miss him, but we will carry on with the work that he had started. So I met in Tambiroch actually at Makere University because it was my lecture of international law during my third year at university. Mm -hmm. If I was asked to describe him, I would say that John was John. He was in his own league. He, you couldn't compare him with anyone. First he was tall, athletic and handsome. And then he was extravagant with his uh, ideas and very articulate in expressing them. So when he was teaching us international law, it is rare to find a person with a command of a subject like him. I've studied in the best universities in the world. Oxford, Yale, Stanford, the London School of Economics, the London School of Oriental African Studies. I've been to Columbia, to Cornell, to whatever university you can choose, Harvard. John is among the best brains I ever came across. So when he came to teach us international law, John always came with a chalk. He never came with the notes at all or anything. And then he would begin discussing international law. You could get a book, you could get anything if you wanted to refer to the case, the headquarters opinion case of the UN or whichever case was there before the International Court of Justice. He had command of it in his brain. I've never seen anything like that. I cannot remember any single lecturer in my life who taught me without notes and yet gave the best notes you could read. In fact, my international law notes, which I still have, I have, I have lent them to so many people later who have not studied international law at different universities. But John dictated those notes without referring to the book. He had mastered the subject after so many years that it just fell out of him. So that is one, extraordinary brilliance. But you can be brilliant and fail to be a good teacher. John was a very, very good teacher. He, was, he knew how to get ideas out of himself and inculcate them with the students in such an entertaining and intellectually stimulating way that it was so difficult for you to avoid attending his lecture. So attending his lecture was like uh, uh, eating chocolate or playing your most favorite game. Because I remember an incident when when the constituent assembly, me and my late friend Bob Kasang, attending a debate on multi-party politics. Those were the days when Uganda was basking with this idealism of creating a democracy. So there was a debate, should Uganda have a movement system of government or a multi-party system of government? The multi-partists were some of the best political intellectuals Uganda had. And then there was the Mushegas, the Kategayas, they were on the other side who were for the movement system, the Amanya Mushegas. So in terms of intellect, the debate was equally balanced. This was uh, what you call a clash between uh, brain titans. And it was so stimulating and of such national significance, you didn't want to leave. But then we had a lecture with John that same day. So we asked ourselves, we used to leave class at school to go and attend the Constituent Assembly debates. Me and Bob Kassam had to walk all the way from the conference center back to McKinley University to attend John's lectures because they had no match in Uganda. There is no intellectual entertainment in Uganda. Maybe the only computer would have been Mohammed Mokdani's lecture. So that is one. But two, he was very, he was not only generous with his ideas, he was generous with his time. Because then we became his friends. I used to visit his home. I would, his kids, like Barbara and Brenner, were a little, I would play with them. His wife, I would eat there. So he would not only teach me, but he also parented me, uh, mentored me, and gave me access to himself and his family and his home. And which is very unique, it's rare to find a person like that. I remember one time we attended a, a debate at McKay University, and that's the picture you see, and there was uh, Tajuddin, who was the head of the Pan-African movement. movement. And you know, John was not keen on these things of Pan Africanism. And he was very critical of socialist ideas, these left wing ideas. But each time there was a debate between leftists and him on the right, 
between command economy and the free market economy. He would speak with flair and uh, confidence. One could even many people mistook his uh, his uh, reverence for arrogance because he spoke with such confidence. And sometimes he, with uh, some not so disguised contempt for people who are intellectually weak, <laughs> eh, that uh, I don't know how to describe it. And then he knew how to accept the audience. Most people who speak very intelligently don't attract a lot of applause. But John was able to express great ideas with such simplicity, such humor, and such style that he would even move a crowd to understand and cheer what he said. The greatest intellectuals, like Daniel Kahneman, for example, he can never appear on TV with his Nobel Prize. He cannot appear on TV in a debate and be as a command such presence. So John would combine his physical and athletic looks with great intellect, then humor and generosity and such extraordinary confidence. Eh? My name is Alan Kasucha. I am a senior journalist at the BBC. I am the host of Africa Daily, which is a podcast that deals with African issues. And I am also lead presenter of Newsday, which is the biggest breakfast show in the world. It is an honor to be able to pay tribute to Professor Tabi Rechi. And I want to say thank you very much to the family, to Mrs. Tabi Rechi to the children, Barbara, Brenda, Brian. Thank you very much for extending me this opportunity. My very first interaction with Professor W. Rachel was when I was trying to get into law school. At the time, I didn't do well enough to go in on government scholarship, so I needed to pay my way through um, the course. So a requirement to be an evening student was that you faced a panel of lecturers, professors from the School of Law and uh, they asked you questions. The questions varied from why you wanted to become a lawyer, whether you had the brains for it, the patience, the focus, and also the financial means to go through the course and interrupt it. And I remember whereas all the other professors, Professor Kakosa, Professor Juko, I think, and others were asking me questions about my capacity uh, to pay for the course and all other questions. Professor Tabi Rechi wanted to know about me. Who am I? What's my philosophy? What are my aspirations? What are my dreams? His presence, his beard, his character, his level of engagement, <laughs> that was memorable. And uh, I met him a few times on campus, he was very gracious, always remembered who I was, remembered my name, kept asking how I was doing. Um, and also, eventually, you know, when I left to go and do other things, um, when I met him, it was a very gracious conversation. I think, one of the things that I learned about him, about his greatness, was not this, was never from him as a person. It was from what other people said of him. And uh, this man, <laughs> if it was up to him, he would have wanted everybody in Uganda to be a lawyer. He was a teacher, a real teacher who concerned himself not just to the performance of a student, but also beyond that, the welfare of the student. You know, there are so many people who have paid tribute to him since he passed away, and that in itself 
has been a motivation for me, a personal challenge. You know, when you hear students saying that I'm a lawyer now because Professor Antabirechi took me to law school, and that I come from a family that could never have afforded the school fees, but I was given the opportunity to study by Professor Antabirechi. When you hear people like my friend Andrew Wenda saying that to them he was a parent and a friend, and in many ways a confidant. When you hear from women who sell at markets that he used to stop on his way to his home village just so he could buy from them, and that might have been the only income they had that day, that he remembered them, that even when he was unwell, he still stopped and interacted with them, that for me is inspiring. And that for me is the ultimate definition of impact. How do you live your life? You live your life to impact other people's lives. So if I'm gracious, if I extend anything, any courtesy to anybody, especially people who are much younger than me, it's because of people like Professor Antonio Rich, people who see you, who hear you, who see your dreams, and who help you achieve those dreams. His name will live on for a very long time. There will be people who will testify of his greatness for a very, very long time. I honor him so much and I pray that he continues to rest in peace. But I also honor his family. I thank you again. You know, I honor Mrs. Tamirechi. She's a fighter, a soldier. She epitomizes commitment. And there are lessons to be learned from that as well. And also the children that they have raised. Barbara, Brenda, Brian. May God bless you. May God give you the fortitude you need to continue with life after the passing of your great, great father. May God bless you all. My name is Dr. Monica Magoke Mpoja from Tanzania. I met the late Professor John when I joined the board of Akode. He was such a joyful man, loving, kind, and the things which are very memorable to me is when he really tried to speak with me in Kiswahili. Haberia Tanzania, Hawajambo Tanzania, and he would be laughing and giving me stories about Tanzania. Wow! And you know, smiling, laughing is good for our health. And the very important thing which has reminded with me is his good leadership skills especially when he was giving guidance you know a chairing the board of a calling he was such a man with wisdom solving some of the problems very very simply a loving father as well so god bless you love to the family he has really lived a great mark in my heart and i've learned leadership skills from him god bless you all thank you very much my name is uh, josephine odera 
and uh, I worked with uh, John Tamburiche both at the University of Nairobi and also at Accord, Uganda. I first met John at the University of Nairobi around 1989. I just joined the teaching staff and here comes this big burly professor and he addresses me as Josephine. I see you have joined the staff. And we had a good laugh around that. I could see that he was uh, experienced already. And over time, we got to talk and do seminars together, present papers at similar events. And then finally, we met at Accord, where he was the chair, and I became his deputy. What I found really interesting about John was uh, his knowledge of African history and also how he um, interacted with people, big, both big and small. I was particularly touched by how he was involved in Uganda's liberation movement, second liberation, I would say, and how he was so closely associated with many other struggles in Africa and his close knowledge of what was happening in those countries. Of course, his knowledge on the environment was something else, and environmental law in particular. Um, John was this sort of person who could make you feel big, even though you were small. I could uh, make you feel very confident about what you're doing. John never set out to make people feel inadequate. He always brought out the positive in people, and try to help as many people as possible. And above all, he was a very jolly person, a boisterous in nature, and uh, a person that you could easily speak to about different things in life. Um, I've taken now, over now as the chair of Accord and trying to walk in uh, John's footsteps, still feeling somehow inadequate because John could reach so, so many people and uh, was always so very helpful. So we miss him, but we appreciate all that he did. Hi, dear friends. I just like to say that I'm very honored to have been given the opportunity to say a few words in honor of my friend and colleague, uh, Professor John Ntabireki. I met John as a young lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He was much older, but I had just joined in 1990 and uh, he had the office next to mine. And so that meant that if I had anything that I needed to ask, I stepped into his office. I developed a close uh, friendship with him and uh, it is not surprising that when he went to work for the UN environment, I went uh, and did a consultancy there and worked with him. I would also say that uh, in later years, John and I met as academics of law and we shared times without number how we wanted the legal uh, landscape to be. John was an idealist and he was a person who wanted to see uh, good ideas come to fruition. I was not surprised when he left Makerere and uh, went and founded the law school at Grotius. And uh, I interacted with him as a board member of uh, the Ad Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment. He was the chair. And each time that John and I met, we reminisced about our old days at the University of Nairobi. But we also shared how we wanted to see the law uh, landscape develop. I had uh, occasion to be the chair of the Kenya School of Law 
and I met students that had come from Grotius Law School and many of them were really grounded and I did give this feedback to John. Uh, John was really a fine mind. Not long ago I met a colleague, Professor Kelly. Professor Ke Patrick Kelly uh, is an emeritus professor at Widener University. Widener had a program that they brought to the University of Nairobi every summer. And uh, we, we taught the students in Nairobi, they visited UNEP, but uh, that stopped uh, just before COVID. I met Kelly not too long ago, we had dinner, he had visited uh, Kenya with his wife, and uh, he asked me, where is John? And he was really shocked when I told him that John was no longer with us. And he said, and I quote, he was one of the finest minds that I had interacted with. That was John. I, I would say that uh, we lost uh, a gallant soldier. Uh, there were many people working on environment. Uh, Professor John Okidi, Charles Okidi rather, is famed as uh, the father of environmental law. And if he was the father of environmental law, because I believe he was older than John, then maybe John was either the younger father or he was an, a grand uncle of environmental law. I would just like to tell the family, Mrs. Ntabireki, we met um, uh, when you just uh, retired from uh, UNICEF when uh, I came to see John when he wasn't feeling well and he was in hospital. And we knew you when you were in Nairobi. I would like to say that uh, we lost uh, a good friend and uh, I do look forward uh, when I am done with my tour of duty as an international civil servant to getting back into the academy and uh, I can assure you that uh, the university that you are now chancellor of will be one of the spaces that I will make a pit stop at. Barbara, uh, continue to work on uh, biotechnology. You are stepping into the grand shoes of your daddy and we are here to spur you along. Thank you and uh, wish you all happy memories and uh, remembrances of our friend and gallant soldier gone to be with the Lord. I came to know the late Professor John Nabrochi in the early 90s but started interacting with him in the year 2002 when he became my lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Makerere University. Professor John Tambiguchi was very passionate about knowledge generation and dissemination, and beyond lecturing, he carried out research and informed a number of laws uh, in this country. John Tambiguchi influenced my career as a researcher, policy analyst, and environmental rights advocate. Minister for Local Government and Member of Parliament of Nyangabo County and the citizen of Toro. Distinguished guests in your various capacities, Bishop Ruenzori Diocese, members of academic and administrative staff of this university in your various ranks, members of the academic community from other universities, the clergy, 
representatives of local governments, graduates, students of this university, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great pleasure to be here for the seventh occasion to welcome you to the Uganda Pentecostal University to attend this congregation and witness the graduations of these young citizens of East Africa in the various ranks as will be demonstrated in the graduation ceremonies. I would now like to thank my friends, the graduates, who today will go through the transition from pupil to master. You came to us to study and we have attempted to make you the best we could. We shall be happy with the persons we have instructed. An old theologian, Thomas Kempis, who lived between 1380 and 1471 AD, observed in his book, The Imitation of Christ, in chapter 16, that be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. We, the university, are happy to have done our job, and now release you to the bigger teacher, which is the world. In that bigger world, please hear and follow the teachings of those great men of learning, to whom we have exposed you. And remember, continue reading. Ladies and gentlemen, go into the world with modesty. Recognize your limits and your extent. Then you will be sure to go forward. It was one cold morning in June, July of 1981 in Nairobi when a friend, Patrick Kibundu, who was at the Kenya School of Law, walked into my little apartment in the doctor's mess at Kenyatta National Hospital with John. I had never met John before and had no idea why they had come that early. John had arrived that morning from Uganda. Patrick went ahead to introduce us and state why he had brought John to my apartment. John had just escaped from Uganda, fearing for his life under the regime at the time. Some of us attending today will be familiar with this story. Patrick made sure to let me know that we might have different political convictions, but we all cared about our country's destiny and the need for, for, for to be there for each other. We then agreed to share our responsibility for supporting John to settle in. John had been robbed on arrival at the Akamba bus station and he did not have any means of survival. Patrick would provide accommodation and I would provide meals while John found his way. We did not have to do this for long as John quickly found his way around and got a job as a teacher at a private school downtown and found his own accommodation in his sleep. A one-bedroom one apartment, as that is all he could afford. 
John was in a hurry to get his own place because he had left possible. They were expecting a baby and he could not imagine not being there for the birth of their first child. Within about 12 months, John had established himself and moved to slightly bigger accommodation. Being the philanthropist he was and taking his family role seriously, John started bringing over his brothers and family members from Uganda, providing them opportunities that they would not have had and quickly filling up his new home. At about the same time, I had completed my internship and had to move out of the doctor's mess. John found me a room on the same block where he was living and I became part of the family. John insisted that I do not cook in my room and that I should have all meals with the family. He also did not expect me to contribute to buy the food in the house. Father and a friend, we did a lot together and were there for each other. I will share just two scenarios to show you who John was to me. After Pasa had arrived in Nairobi and they needed to formalize their marriage, John asked me to be his best man and witness to their marriage, which I was honored to do. Later, when I needed to visit my future in-laws for introductions, it was payback time. John became my parent. When my mother was ill and eventually passed away in Nairobi while I was away in the U.S., John took responsibility until I was able to travel back and ensure that we gave her a deserving funeral back in Uganda. Our greatest bond was based on mutual trust and respect, but most important in knowing that John would always tell me the truth, even when he knew it would hurt. Many of us will share our experiences with John, but I wanted to share this personal story to show you who John was even when he did not have much to share. He was always a family man, a philanthropist, and truthful to his friends and foe alike. May his soul rest in eternal peace and may the good Lord enable those of us still here to carry forward his legacy. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Opio Lawyer, Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University here in London, Ontario. I am truly humbled to say a few words at the inaugural uh, Professor John Tamarechi's lecture. Now, there is so much to say about my brother John. Of course, the word brother is sometimes used loosely as a term of endearment. In my case, I might have come from Gulu and John from Ibanda. But we were truly brothers. I first met John, his wife Pelusi, and two little children, Barbara and Brenda, in the spring of 1985 at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He had completed his Master's of Laws at the University of Nairobi and enrolled at Queen's Law in the PhD program. Now, the very first day we met in their modest little townhouse, John decided we were brothers, and that was that. There was no arguing about it. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing he would hide from me. Issues would be discussed in my presence. He told me without mentioning his words, for example, to settle down and get married. That was John. John had a very sharp mind and very little patience. When he loved you, and he loved a lot of people, he gave you his full attention. He pushed himself to extend research in international law, which he studied in Kenya. But he also pushed his wife, Pelusi, to do a master's in education. The evening at John's apartment were transformed into long strategy sessions. You woman, he would say lovingly to Pelusi, where is your essay? And then he would turn to me, my brother, what about your project? How is it coming along? I credit John for encouraging me to get into graduate school. Well, to be very honest with you, it was more than encouragement. Okay, he just told me flat out, Opio, you need 
to do your master's now instead of two years later. Uh, when I protested, I protested that I needed money uh, first, he said, what money? I will work hard and I'll give you the money that you need. So the next day I borrowed this old Russian built ladder vehicle and drove two hours away to the University of Ottawa to pick up the application form for the master's program. Uh, in those days, there were no online application. So we spent the next couple of days completing the application and writing all the essays that were needed to go with the application. And so in the summer of 1986, I was accepted in the master's program at the University of Ottawa. Of course, it paved the way later for my PhD. So that was Pure John. He believed in education as the equalizer, and was relentless in pushing I his own family and extended family to get an education, to go higher. My name is Dennis Thomas Lukaya. I will be master of ceremonies this afternoon. I take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to this very important event. It's an event to remember life. It's an event to celebrate life. But it is also an event to put us onto the pathway of maintaining the legacy of uh, Professor Tambirechi John. Before us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, most important is to announce that the university is fully represented and uh, dutifully represented here. As long as we have our chancellor, the chancellor of uh, Uganda Pentecostal University, uh, Dr. Maggie Chigozi is here with us. <laughs> Equally, and we all know what a chancellor is, the titular head, the person that makes the university the person who gives it gravitas. So we are grounded as we sit here. The chairman of the university council, the highest policy and decision making organ of the university, uh, Dr. Nathan Karema, you are very, very, very welcome. You know they say that uh, a chair of council is the chief employer, but the chair of council is equally the university's greatest friend because they deal with what makes the university what it is. We have a number of guests. We will be introducing them as they uh, come through shortly. But uh, I would like to critically say that uh, you are welcome. We have a very important uh, discourse to engage ourselves with. The theme for today's public lecture, Enhancing Equity and Access for Higher Education, Addressing Disparities and Striving for Inclusivity. We all know that uh, UPU is an old institution. It's an institution that now has cut its teeth in the education sector of East Africa. It is an interesting university because it fits the narrative that a university must never be an ivory tower. B this university clearly depicts a center of knowledge, a center of learning. We also know from its history that uh, UPU um, uh, derived its uh, foundation from a uh, Grotius School of Law. I have always wondered why, or I should also say that my claim to fame here today is that uh, when I was in Makerere, um, I met Professor Antambirechi. 
And together with friends of mine, uh, the Honorable Dongo To, Asman Basalirwa, Francis Gimara, we needed his help at a certain time. So he helped us, and we he procured the meeting for us at the Nile Martians or Serena. And uh, we were assisted in a predicament that we had landed ourselves successfully into. But the greatest name, Hugo Greatest, or Hugo de Groot, was a Dutchman. He was a Dutchman, he was a lawyer, he was a jurist, he was a poet, he was a playwright. And this Hugo is an interesting character, born 1583. By the age of 11, he was joining university. And at age 14, he had his bachelor's degree. And at 16, he had made a very big contribution. No wonder the argument that he is the, you know, ideologue or the intellectual father of international law. Like Professor Antambirechi, uh, Hugo Greatus also had a wife, Maria. And Professor Antambirechi, too, had his sweetheart, Percy. He was a lawyer, just like John Antambirechi. He never really did practice law because he said the moral fiber for being a lawyer he had trouble with. John Intambirechi too decided to be a lawyer who did not go into court. Hugo Greatus was very keen on uh, uh, injustices and uh, speaking out against them, speaking for human rights. He was a political activist and found himself into exile. John Intambirechi too found himself in exile. Hugo Greatus also, when he went to exile, he was broke. He had no money, all assets frozen. The story is told that John Intambirechi went to Kenya in exile and he lost out his property. So he had to look for friends to help. Like Hugo Greatus, Hugo escaped from prison when he was arrested in a book chest. He used to love books, so they kept bringing books for him in prison. So his wife pondered with an idea and said, you know, the soldiers are no longer checking the books and the trunk in and out. Why don't you lay in this thing? We call you books and we take you. And indeed, Hugo Greatus escaped. Uh, Professor Pelsi will one day tell us how Professor Antambirechi in 1780 also escaped to Nairobi. Uh, Hugo Greatus also escaped to France where he was, uh, uh, he dressed as a, a mason, you know, a stone man. So really, the essence here is that uh, Professor Antambirechi chose the name Greatus because I think there's a lot of similarity. Also important on that with Hugo Greatus is that uh, he was his teachings were responsible for the uh, Rutheran, uh, Methodist, and the Pentecostal uh, uh, churches coming into fruition and the idea. And what a name for the university, Uganda Pentecostal University. So I think we are proud that uh, we are here to celebrate um, the achievements of a great man. Hugo Greatus also, uh, like Professor Antambirechi, died in, uh, at about uh, age 62, Professor Antambirechi age 67, 68. Quite a lot of parallels. So ladies and gentlemen, as we are now um, ready to begin, Mr. U.S., I need uh, my pastor. Uh, 
Is my pastor ready? Okay. But that will be after the um, uh, anthems. So once again, I warmly welcome you. I would ask the DJ if you are ready. We would like to set ourselves into motion. I once again warmly welcome each one of us here. Let us celebrate and learn and appreciate the noble work done by Professor Ntambirechi in the field of education, in the field of environment, and in the field of uh, uh, human rights and uh, peace and justice. So ladies and gentlemen, for us to kick off, I'm going to ask us to stand up for the anthems. We will have Uganda, Toro Kingdom, and the UPU. And then we'll have a word of prayer thereafter. Oh, yes, we'll have uh, Uganda, East Africa, and uh, a Toro through to UPU. I thank you for that correction. <coughs> Okay, um, we ask for providence, for forgiveness, for indulgence, but uh, can I now invite uh, Apostle Muhumuza to give us a word of prayer? Thank you very much. Let's humble ourselves for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, King of Glory, we stand before you this morning. We thank you for the gift of life, for we cannot take it for granted that we are here. This is the day that you have made. As we gather here to remember our own, a father, a teacher, an investor, an icon of our knowledge, our own uh, Professor John in Tamiruchi. We commit our souls at this juncture 
into your hands. We pray that all shall be well with us as we commemorate the passing on of your dear servant, as he used to say, that he is a bishop because he used to touch many lives through education, even reaching out and caring for their social welfare. Father, we thank you for this day has come also. And we believe that we shall be able together to put up the solidarity as we launch this foundation. Above all things, may our Holy Spirit lead us and Father want to come against every forces of darkness. Whatever evil force, whatever powers of darkness that may want to disrupt uh, this move, we come against it in Jesus' mighty name. We render it powerless. And we call upon the power of the Holy Ghost to lead us to give us an insight that at the end of the day, it shall all be good, that we shall receive victory. As he used to encourage us, we encourage others. Father, we want to commit the university into your hands, to which he put his brain and the other fellows to come up with. We pray that you will, Father, continue to lead this university, that the vice chancellor and the chancellor and the chair will further take it in the direction and in the desire exactly he wanted it to be. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We exalt your holy name. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Apostle Muhumza. Thank you, thank you. Please, you could take your seats. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you to this inaugural John Tambirechi um, uh, Memorial Lecture here at uh, uh, Muchwa, the campus venue. Our speakers are, are here. Um, the program, for those that uh, um, do not know, I will run through briefly. We will now have opening remarks from UPU, that is from the chair and then who will invite the chancellor. Then the introduction of the event by uh, Accord, Dr. Arthur uh, Beinom Jisha. We will also have welcome remarks from Toro Kingdom. The message from the LC5 or their representative if they are here. Message from the MP for Porto City the Honorable Alex Rohunda, who is uh, with us. Honorable, you are very, very welcome. We have a video by APT, um, a, a tribute to Professor John Intambirechi, which will be played here. The keynote address by uh, Professor um, Palamagamba John Mwaliku Aiden Kabudi, who sent an apology, uh, unable to travel. Those of you who read the um, Mind About East Africa and its occurrences, um, Tanzania is in a period of five-day mourning after the passing of a former Prime Minister, Loasa, who had uh, was a presidential candidate against uh, his party, CCM. But uh, the strength of the party believes his spirit remained in the party. So five days of mourning. And uh, Professor Kabudi, as a member of parliament, was unable to make it. But we hope he will be here at uh, graduation. Um, we shall have panel discussions on the topic, government policies and initiatives by Dr. Eric uh, Jita, the Principal Education Officer. Dr. Jita, you are very welcome. You could stand up and uh, the people see that uh, you are here. 
I'm uh, uh, Dr. Michael Atim, a lecturer at the Faculty of Science at Mbara University of Science and Technology. We'll speak about identifying opportunities for increased uh, access. Dr. Michael Atim. At Mbarara, I know that Dr. Tim has been very um, uh, pivotal in the entrenching of the HEC, the Higher Education Certificate. It is a wonderful opportunity for many people who may at one point in time uh, uh, did not get the requisite uh, um, uh, points or marks to join university. You have a second chance. And we now know UNEB has also announced all those people, wherever you are, and uh, have been following the old curriculum, please, there will be an opportunity for you to receive Form 4. Adult education, we need to tell all our people so that you close off with the old curriculum as they go into the competence-based curriculum. There is an opportunity this year to have national exams special for all those who would like to do uh, ordinary level in particular. We have uh, um, uh, uh, promoting gender equality and inclusivity. Uh, Mrs. Elizabeth uh, Ramwenge from uh, Mountains of the Moon, you are very, very welcome this afternoon. She's seated uh, here, busy looking through the um, uh, presentation. I don't know if it is my remarks that have made you change your presentation. Uh, the role of uh, civil society and private uh, sector. Um, uh, Dr. Arthur Benomjisha, the ED of ACCORD. Ladies and gentlemen, ACCORD is a, a very important organization in our Mideast and in this country through to East Africa. Like Professor Ntambireki, they have really spread through East Africa and are doing a very wonderful job. No wonder uh, Professor Ntambirechi remained chair from uh, inception until his uh, return to the Savior. Thank you very much, Accord, for being here. Dr. Bainom Jisha, thank you, thank you. Yes, I don't know, I was not looking at you, but did you stand up and wave? Did the people see you properly? Yes. Um, we will also have an interactive uh, session. So ladies and gentlemen, the, present the presenters will make their remarks. We'll keep our questions so that we have a one session for sharing experiences. Then after that, we'll have the official launch of the John Intambirechi Foundation, um, uh, JNF. We'll close off by a, a memorandum or call to action, uh, a commitment to ensuring equity and access of education. Then uh, the chair of council, uh, Dr. Nathan Karema, will give a vote of thanks, our closing prayer. Then we'll have a meet and uh, greet. At three, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a health break, pick a snack, and return for the interactive session. Now, as we get into our speeches, um, I am going to request that uh, we, every speaker, I request to be, ask you to be kind enough to donate some of your time to the next speaker. Please let us be in the spirit of donating. Let us donate our time, and it is also nice when you donate time. You know, you donate it in twos. Okay, donate your time in twos. I hope we will be able to see a lasting impression of time donation here, so that nobody finishes their time. And uh, I beg that as you make your presentations, important as they are, let us hurry slowly. Allow me at uh, this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, to delve into the welcome remarks. I am going to um, humbly take the honor and pleasure to invite the 
chairman or chairperson of the University Council, Uganda Pentecostal University of Uganda, Dr. Nathan Karema. Dr. Karema is a distinguished uh, scholar in his own right, strong on his views, a man of great faith, but a believer in uh, health and uh, institutions. Those of us who live in Imbarara know that uh, he believes in the wellness of health in terms of education and service delivery. Dr. Karema, you are very, very welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony. <coughs> I want to welcome all of you here. here. Today is a very important day in the life of Uganda Pentecostal University. But more important, it's a day of remembering the life of late Professor Tamiruachi and trying to connect his life, past life and the present occurrences in the world we live in. I want to welcome the uh, Chancellor of the University, Dr. Maggi, you are very welcome. I want to welcome the Vice Chairman of the Board, of trustees, Dr. Arthur, by you are very welcome. The Vice Chancellor of our university, Madame Damwechi, sweetheart. <laughs> she warned me recently not to call him sweetheart. <coughs> but uh, I got attempted and call him sweetheart sometimes. But Damwechi had allowed me to do so, so I'm not afraid. I want to welcome very many important personalities have come to attend this important function. I want to read my time, but I cannot do that before I tell you what Tom Rich was in my life. Tom Rich was a man. Death is bad. I hate death. Death that I took John is bad. John was my friend. We did many things together. We had a different understanding over issues. But I can count how many times I won my argument. I can't count, many, I can't count how many times he won his arguments. Even if I won, he would refuse. Even if I got annoyed, he would laugh. Even if I, I stood up and sent him to go out, he would say, go, you come back, and I would come back. <laughs> he, was, he was a person that was alone. As I have many friends. I have many friends. In two weeks' time, I'll, I'll count my 77 years. But I can confidently tell you Confidently tell you, I'm not forced to say that the lies here. Ntambiroch was among my best friends, my best confidants, my chief advisor. Ntambiroch died. But I'm very proud that he did not leave nothing behind. He left all these people and others that you cannot see behind. If you can know what these people are, Maggie, if Mike can spend here 24 hours here, you can multiply that time in money. He would have made a lot of money on his computer, not even leaving his office. People like Winomisha and others, his deputy there, my son. These are people who who cost their time and money. But be here for hours and hours, days. Now I'm here for seven days. So is, 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 is Arthur. So is, 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 is 
very wonderful people. Thank you very much for coming, all of you. Thank you very much. I want to tell you one very few minutes, in few minutes, how this UPU came to be here and came in existence. Some of you don't know. I would wonder if, if many of you knew. I met in Tamburochi in a hotel in Kampala. Victoria Hotel, if some of you know that hotel. We just sat opposite each other. He kept looking on my face, looked at his face. No, he looked like a Kenyan. You know Kenyans, Kenyans, you, you have to be careful. <laughs> he, will, he, will, he will ask you who you are before you ask him who you are. They are very generous people. Very generous people, Kenyans. So eventually he moved. He said, but you man, tell me your name. I saw a giant over there and more. I said, my God. No, he was like this. He came. As he comes, I shrink. As he comes, I shrink. I said, what does this man now want? <laughs> you know, these were difficult days. <laughs> difficult days when some of us had been, uh, what I don't want to mention here, but uh, <laughs> it happened. So I thought maybe he was one of those. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they had come to ask me what I was doing there. So I, I, go, I prepared my heart, asked what I should tell him. said, you man, what do you want here? Tell me your name. I looked at him. I said, I'm Dr. Nathan Karema. Oh, you are the one. Uh, now my heart went off. I said, I'm finished. So I said, who are you? I said, I'm John Tamrochi. Uh, I want to talk to you. I was reading a book. He looked at the book. He said, oh. I want to talk to you. He said, yes. Um, where do you work from? I told him everything about myself. He said, oh, you are the right person I want. I want to start a university. University? I said, are you, are you a professor or something? He said, yes. I teach at the university. told me I have started a, 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 a department of uh, law faculty at uh, Uganda, Uganda uh, Christian University. And now I want to start my own. Can you get me land from Barara? I said, yes, why not? Let's go. Now we sat and started the UPU. The rest is history. Started the UPU. We couldn't get land from Barara. Then eventually he told me, Karima, let's go and look for land. We came to Fort Potro. We met good people. They gave us where to start the university from. And that's how the university started. I have been chairman of this university for over 15 years. So I know its growth, I know its strength, I know its weaknesses. And I'm proud to be part of those processes. <laughs> Professor Antamir which was a giant. When he got annoyed in a room, all of us would look at each other and, and and shrink. When he smiled, we all laughed. Ntambirochi was independent of himself. He was independent of his thinking. He was independent of his decision making. He was independent of what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. It would take him time to change his mind. One time, one time, the government of this country called me and uh, called in Tambrochi independently. And we went for interview that had been selected among other 250 Ugandans to go to Chuba for training. You remind me, I don't want, I, I want to be generous. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we are, we are chosen and we went to Chuba. And uh, the present president of Uganda, I'm seven, Told on Tambrochi, Tambrochi in Kumanya. I said, Yes, sir. Amana Banjo in Bridge said, Yes, sir. Kariman Depto Awe. He told us in Runyankori. But I think uh, all of you know, if you don't know Runyankori, then you're in trouble. And, uh, 
<coughs> Karema is your deputy. You are the leader of the group. Take these people in Chuba and learn counterintelligence to come back and save this country. We did. We took 250 people to Chuba. We were put in sections and I was put in a section of Tambrochi. <laughs> and because we were moving together all the time, talking our things quietly, we found ourselves sitting next to each other. Because I pushed a chair and asked him to sit. After only one month, Tambrochi fell in trouble. He came and told me in my room, Nathan, I can't allow this. This question of saying we should not go to town, we should not leave the campus, are we secondary school students? I don't go and look for, for whatever I want. No. Me, I'm going out. I'm reaching up with you. I beseech you, you are the leader. If you break the law, when you go back, they won't put you in Ruzira. He said no. He asked me, and I'll never forget the question. He said, are you Christian? I said, yes, I'm Nathan Karima, I'm baptized. Are you confirmed? Yes. I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? He said, I know. You know what he did? I said, what did he do? He died for people. I'm going to die for people. I said, but, he, but this was the son of God. He said, I'm a son of God. I looked at the man. And I knew because of what I knew that he was going to do it. I told him, you are not going. He said, I'm going. You are not going. I said, I'm going. I find a way of stopping him. I couldn't because I couldn't report him. I would be reporting myself. In the evening, he came to my room, said, lend me your shoes. I said, I'm not giving you my shoes. Thing, they, they said they ought to have cooperated and, and, and they, they, because, because our shoes had numbers. It, everything of you has had a number. Number one, number two, but it's terrible. Number one, number two, number three, number four. I was a number 15. Cambridge was a number 16. So if they see my shoe, they, they will ask. I said, oh, you are a coward. I said, then I gave me proverb in Runyankore. I'm sorry, I'm going to say it in Runyankore. Those who sit with people who don't know Runyankore, please interpret for them. He said, I told him, I said, watch Manzi, Nwara, watch Tini, Nwasheka. You can't be coward, let me be a coward. Let me be a coward. But in the evening, I'll be laughing. You'll be brave. Tomorrow, you'll be crying in prison. He said, okay, we shall meet in heaven. That's what he told me. And indeed, he left. The rest is the detail. He left. He left. He went to town. I don't know what he did because I was not with him. But we were told in the morning that the leader of the squad had been arrested and was in prison in Cuba. And they declared, therefore, that Nathan Karima is the leader from now on because we don't know when Kamiwich is coming back. He might be deported. I want you to imagine how I felt. It was bad. I left my room crying. I mean the extra room. I went to my room. I prayed. I said, God, if you have never heard me, hear me now. Hear me for the last time, will God. Let him come, Rochi. Not be deported, but come back here. Lead me, I look for him. I went back to the class. I asked the Chuban lecturer. I said, I'm going to look for my brother. In every prison. He said, no, don't, don't. You cannot leave. If you leave now, you also go in prison. I'm going to give you an escort. Take it where he is. I said, thank you. They drove me in a car. 152 miles. Where I'm going to was. I went to the deputy commander of the battalion. Said, I'm Nathan Karima, I'm a brother to John Tambrochi, who's in here as a prisoner. We are not allowed to see him. 
He's a criminal. He was found not drinking, and therefore, we cannot allow him. See that you want to drink. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You know what he drinks? Do you know what he drinks? I said, yes, I do. But he drinks a little. <laughs> And he took me, found a which had put on the uniform for prisons. And when he looked at me, he said, <laughs> You're fair away. It's fair, you're not fair. You coward. You coward, you have come here to do what now? <laughs> I'm facing my duty that Jesus Christ did. You wait, I've written my statement. I'm not going to be here for long. I'm going back. To... And he was talking in English. This people could not English, of course, he didn't know they don't know English. I was given 20 minutes to talk to the commander. I told him, if you put him in prison, all of us, tomorrow, we are writing to Uganda to come and pick us. That we, Tambuchi, we cannot stay. And I want you to put him in prison without a case. I'm not leaving this place. I started crying. All commanders would come to see me crying. I refused to talk to them. I want you to open it for me. I get inside there. They got scared. Eventually, I don't want to go into long stories. They took us to the Ministry of Defense. We made a statement of apology that we shall not do it again. But Ndamrech refused to get out. Do you know what Ndamrech did? After having been released, he refused to get out of prison. I said, Ndamrech, what do you want to do? He said, no, I want them to write a statement saying we are allowed to go out of the school on the weekend. We are prisoners. He refused. I went back, I told them, you just allow us, but I'll make sure students to go out of the school. They don't go, but just allow us for him to go out. The commander allowed. He wrote a statement. Ntamro, he refused to sign it. He said that he himself wants to write it. He said, I'm a lawyer. So they allowed, they allowed him to write a statement, saying, we, the Chuban School of Intelligence, do hereby, I still remember the letter. <laughs> Do hereby allow the school of intelligence students to go out on Saturdays for only one hour. And can we negotiate the for two hours for two hours? <laughs> Eventually they changed it with a pen. Because it had been signed. Changed with a pen, they put their two hours. They, they gave him the to me to take. Make sure I take him to the school. I took him to school. He went laughing at me, you are a rich fairer. <laughs> now, if I saved in prison, what have I saved you? We took, I took him back to school, and everybody came to him clapping their hands, oh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. That's why I'm Tamruch. I have many stories I can tell you about Tamruch. Very interesting stories. Very interesting. When we came back from Cuba, <coughs> You know, me and Tamrochi had been dealing with wrong to the other part of the people. You know the part of the people? <laughs> Many of you are younger, you don't know. <laughs> the part of the people. Ah, ah, eh, eh, ah, ah. We belong there, Tamrochi. But Tamrochi had changed from the part of the people to UPM. This is why I parted with him. I said no. Me, I'm not going to leave the part of the people. I live in the UPC until it ends my life. Time which went to. But uh, eventually, <laughs> circumstances forced him also uh, to leave. Tambuchi was a very kind man. He loved the people. He cared for the care for people who didn't have any help. This university would be ahead of the universities. But he told people for nothing. This is another area he called with him and he refused to change. Half of the school would find they don't pay fees. Tiny cent, tiny cent. Mwenafe, tiny cent. Kaima, we cannot live for money only. Tiny cent. Half of the school, not even paying half of the tuition, but free. You find the, the whole school, we had a population over so many people. But how many paid fees? Almost a quarter. Also paying half. 
He was generous. He was very generous. We clap, clap, clap for John. Clap for him. He was a very wonderful man. Very careful man. You loved him, he loved you. You hated him, you parted ways. If you wanted to come back, you come back. If you don't want to come back, go away. He lived his entire life. Kamrochi, Kamrochi, Kamrochi. Stay in peace. I thank you indeed. I want to welcome our esteemed something else. Oh, you all. Oh. I want to welcome our esteemed, yes, still, Vice Chancellor, Mrs. John Tamrochi, sweetheart, uh, to invite the uh, uh, to invite the Chancellor of the University, Madame Maggie. Thank you very much. I hope I have been very kind. Yes, you have, and I appreciate. I had reached uh, the Honorable MP for us, um, uh, Akiki, Dr. Iksobok, yes. <laughs> I can see the Prime Minister of Toro Kingdom. You're welcome. <laughs> All government officials here present. Uh, I can see Mr. Rob Hing, I was supposed to be here, but maybe he's on the way. Uh, my boss, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Maggie Kigozi, uh, you're very, very welcome. And um, the board members, Dr. Arthur, my name Gisha, and Irene, you're very welcome. And the council, uh, you've had the council chairperson, my boss, Dr. Nathan Kar Kalema, uh, my sister, um, from civil authority. You're very, very welcome to be here. She's also my boss in another capacity. Olive Limonia. Uh, she's also the chairperson of Uganda Women's Effort to Save Orphans Board. So happy to have you here. Um, my dear in-laws, relatives, the students of this university, the alumni, all of us in our different capacities, especially our dear uh, presence, the guild president, I can't forget the guild president uh, who is here. Please stand for recognition so that they know that I have the president in our midst. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are very much welcome for this very important day. It's a very important day um, for us. We're here with our honored scholars. It's both an honor and a poignant moment as we gather for the inaugural memorial lecture in tribute to the esteemed flamboyant Professor John Ntambirochi. As the previous mentioned, John Ntambirochi was uh, a gallant educator. He was a trailblazer, he was a philanthropist, he was a legal scholar, a renowned legal scholar globally. He was an event environmentalist. He was a mentor. He was a husband of mine for 46 years. He was a father, a brother. <laughs> so good to see uh, Council Kandiri here. He was a friend and a family man. <coughs> but he transitioned from this earth on this same day, 12th February 2023. First, I would like to thank God, the Almighty, for his grace. It has, been, it has not been easy. It has been vital for me, my children. Barbara, stand up. She's the only one here today. Um, and relatives, and all of us, the UPU fraternity, the friends, all of us. It has not been easy. 
because he was a very special man. He was someone I had known, as I said, and loved for quite a, for donkey years. And the loss was monumental. But all in all, God has been faithful. He has seen us through. He's still my rock, my shield, and he has kept us going for the last 10 long months. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate deeply your being here at Muchwa and in Fort Potro. This is a place Professor John Tamwechi spent 20 years of his life in this space. Those of you uh, uh, who, are, who may not be here physically and a lot of people complained about this event being on a Monday, we are streaming live. I hope you'll be able to follow. And we are being uh, supported by App Media. And as usual, Sol and your team, you do such great work. You will not miss much. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation. But let me take this opportunity to appreciate all of us who draw from all corners of this country, from Entere, Kampala, Ambarara, Ibanda, and Visheshe, and within Fort Porch, of course. On our very nice road from Kampala, uh, if you are neat for, for many weeks, you have, uh, you have to go for, for repairs of your back, as well as the repairs of your car. Anyway, we are here for a great reason. The UPU Council, chaired by Dr. Nathan Kalema, is a very passionate man. Uh, immediately, the first meeting after Mzee passed, he said, every graduation, there will be a lecture in memory of my brother, and he was very loud. We have to have this memory. I want to thank you, Dr. Karim, and your team. Uh, and for, for this great idea, that is one of the reasons why we're here. We, as John's uh, family, the John Interbridge Foundation, we had said we'd do a lecture, but he lifted it higher uh, to associate it with Uganda Pentecostal University, working very closely with Accord. Um, so we are launching the foundation today, and the UPU and us will champion this event on an annual basis. Allow me to start extend my warm welcome to Mzee's family. I'll actually ask you to stand up. I can see Kandela and Christine. Kandela, senior counsel, uh, is, a, is a Christian, is a canon of, of our church. And this is John's youngest brother, and your wife, Christine. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I, of course, would like to introduce uh, uh, his sister. I saw him. Jolly. Jolly is his sister. I think you follow. You followed him there, right? Yes, and I think I saw your son. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Mbarara. would like to recognize other, other relatives who are here, they are sitting around here, Dina, uh, Simon, please stand up, those of you, my in-laws, oh, of course, Dr. Ha, well, what is the title these days? Goddard, very big man in the army, when he sat in, I almost took off. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd like, of course, to recognize all of you and for being very committed to Mze and to myself. Uh, the donkey has been there. Thank you so much for coming on this day and for being here with us. Uh, we are here, uh, you know, before Mze was yours, <laughs> he was ours. He was uh, strictly ours. He was a family man, a proud single man. And then the world took him up and he became a big, a big factor in the world, as we shall be hearing. So I'd like to welcome you so much. Allow me to introduce Barbara again, counsel and senior researcher, Barbara Antambirochi. Some of you may be reading about her in the papers. Uh, she's been instrumental in pulling off this function. She's made all the calls, she's distributed the cards, she drove everywhere, and uh, she has been very, very active with the leg work because she's the only one here. Uh, senior Associate Brenda Tambirechi is not here with us, but she's online. She can't make it physically because in January this year she changed jobs uh, and continents. Uh, she relocated from the Middle East to Europe 
We are taking in Tamburiki name everywhere. She's now based in Dublin, Ireland, uh, working in a very big law firm there. So, uh, but Brenda is very passionate about the foundation, is actually the, behind the, the brain behind it. Um, she, she, she's, be, she's been very, very active, and, and herself and Crichton and Ritesiga, they are our, our, our guru. They are branding, they edit everything. I thought a new English. They said, no, mommy, that's too old fashioned. We will do it differently. And Brenda and Crichton have been excellent. All these things you see here are part of their ideas. Uh, Muse, uh, we call him Muse Brian these days. Uh, he's the uh, heir to Muse, but at the very last minute when she was about to fly from Nairobi, uh, she was asked to work because there was a crisis in, in his organization called Ofi uh, Africa Talent Initiative. And being the chief operations officer at that organization, he had no choice but to stay. I think he must be grabbing some time also to be online. And uh, the two younger children, Melissa and Max Millen, they're in school. Uh, they, are, they are still at that age, so we shall miss them too. They are not here. So uh, I, I'd like to, to, to welcome you all. I know uh, Mrs. Council, Mrs. Kargonjo, and Mr. and Mrs. Walugende, if you can wave. Uh, these are Trevor's relatives. Thank you so much for coming. So happy to see you here. I mean, I could go on and on <laughs> welcoming individuals. But I wanted to speak a bit, a bit about my dear sister, Olive Lumonia. He's the chairperson of US, as I mentioned. But then she had to cancel a meeting with the director of the civil aviation to be here. Honestly, I, I, I'm touched. And she's a member of the John Foundation, John Luther and Rich Foundation. So pleased that you're here, and they are really, really honored that you joined us in the John Luther and Rich Foundation. She's a great woman, and I think with her, we are going to, do, to go places. Uh, Mrs. Irene Kosega, board, board member, but a, a, a dear sister, very good that you are, you are here. Uh, we have other meetings coming up. So I would like really to thank you most sincerely, especially those who contributed uh, to, to make sure that this function is a success. Uh, Dr. Nathan Karima was the first one to send his contribution. I give him a very <laughs> big clap. And of course, uh, Dr. Professor Maggie Kigozi, all the water you're seeing, all these beautiful things you are drinking, uh, cuts of Pepsi, because uh, she's um, big, as you know, in Pepsi. Of course, I cannot uh, stop here. Uh, Dr. Arthur Dynamics and Onesmus, we had sessions and sessions about this lecture, the brain work and the money, and everything that you put in place for this to happen. Uh, I'm very, 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 very indebted to you. I wish to thank Stambic Bank, colleagues from Stambic Bank, they were here earlier, I think they're still here. Please, if Stanford, you know, may get clients. Yeah, <laughs> Stambic Bank, uh, thank you for supporting us. And um, we got, uh, got uh, uh, some big support. We have a, a family friend, he's called Paul Windy. He's based in Oswatina. I worked there for five years. <laughs> it was such a small kingdom, I never wanted to leave. Uh, he has contributed substantially uh, for this. I uh, would like, he's a director of a Nyasi group, and I think they are doing some work also in Uganda. I would like to thank um, uh, Honorable William Bell Resort here, Mountains of the Moon Hotel. Uh, he did also make a handsome contribution. But I would also sincerely would like to thank the UPU alumni, all of you who are here. Please stand up. And particularly the team from Kenya. <laughs> they drove all the way. They arrived in Fort Porto, I think, at 2 a.m. Please stand up, uh, TZ and your team. Uh, and we really. And, and we really want to, to grow the alumni so that uh, UPU thrives. Thank you for taking it to Kenya and make sure the Kenyan students return. We had quite a number before. Uh, our student number 001, Moses Ingura, is our university lawyer. <laughs> I, I'm singling him out because he was the first one to join us when he had nothing. <laughs> so uh, he's now our lawyer and he's, he has a big farm in town. We really, really appreciate all the good work you've done. Uh, we, we got uh, uh, colleagues from Kenya, Tumel Shukuru Sana. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We have uh, a good friend of Muzei called Council Ahmed Nasir. 
those of you who are on Twitter, you know him. He was a student in the 90s in Nairobi, and uh, class of the 90s. They are very generous, and one of them actually came all the way to go to Bshesha to see where Mzei was laid. So he did make a quite a good contribution um, for this function to take place. So I treasure you, I, I, I don't know, and of course I treasure most the people who said the prayers, those who fasted, those who encouraged the numerous uh, uh, struggles, but I would like first of all to appreciate the UPU fraternity. Please stand up, because without you, UPU will not be if you can stand up, please, students, and uh, the deans and the lecturer, the guild president, uh, the dean of students, um, this is UPU. And uh, they come from all corners of this country. And we, of course, have a very dynamic team. They also contributed handsomely for this function to take place. So I thank you so much, my colleagues. And I know you struggle so much on a daily basis. But when it came to your professor, you had to do what you had to do. Uh, I'm about to finish, but our keynote speaker, Professor Palamagamba John Kabudi, the eminent legal scholar and politician, who was actually invited by a court. We'd like to thank them very much. He was able to record himself, and I don't want to go into the details, because uh, already we've been told why he's not here. But allow me to thank our eminent scholars who are here, who traveled all the way from uh, their universities to be here. As UPU, we travel, work, we, we really, really uh, uh, allow, I mean, allow, we enjoy working with other universities around us. And if we have to go, we have partner with many, many people, including the universities around us. So please stand up for recognition. I know you, were, you had before Dr. Eric Gitter. He's a policyman uh, from the Ministry of Education and Sports. He'll tell us about all these policies. And, uh, and uh, um, some, uh, Dr. I'm sorry to call you Mr. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Maiko Atim. Thank you very much. All the way from Mass in Barara. He's been very, very instrumental. We are working together on another program. Thank you so much for coming. And my sister. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Ramonge. He will come here to talk about ladies. Why are they dropping out of school? What should we do? Thank you so much for coming. We value your time. We value your ideas. And we cannot wait to hear what you're going to tell us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as we embark on this intellectual journey under the theme enhancing equity and access to higher education, addressing disparities, and striving for inclusion, you had Dr. Karema. This was the mantra for Muzei. For him, it didn't matter. Uh, if somebody was not in school, the whole village is where I come from. Everybody has been here, and they all have degrees. And anybody he came across, he wanted them to be lawyers. Um, but he has, this is what he really valued. We could have started the first lecture as him as an environmental expert, as environmental lawyer, as a legal scholar. He has written immensely in that topic, but we said no. Spent 20 years here talking about inclusion, talking about higher education. Let's start with what he valued, and we see how we take it forward. So I know we are, he was such a visionary person, and um, we were here to, to make sure that we embrace this challenge and take it forward. Uh, one of those noble pursuits that he had. Professor Tamburechi was passionate for equitable education. That's why we chose this topic, as I said earlier. And we believe that this theme is a very fabric of what he believes in. It is urging us to strictly and seriously examine the, the disparities within our educational systems, critically, what is going on. I uh, will be hearing figures of what is going on. The court that stands in P7, where do they go? By the time they reach P7, by the time they reach S4, by the time they reach S6, and by the time they reach university. We really have to take very, very serious uh, study in this and see, as a country, what can we do to make a difference to many, many children that may not be making it to where some of us have reached. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, I firmly believe that our goal in life is not really forever, even me, by the way, I'm on the way. Our goal should be to create something that will 
and Professor Ntambureki illustrated that. That's why we are all here. And this afternoon we shall see, we shall be, we shall, he we shall hear more. And I believe that death should not be allowed to end the sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates uh, it to lofty significance. So I believe Mzee is up there somewhere looking at us and saying, um, the dead are never dead until we forget them. And we are not willing to forget him. To live in our hearts, we live behind, is not to die. So Mzee has ever died. Yeah, I don't know. I don't believe. I saw him being lowered there, but I still believe that he's here. He lives with us, within us. And he, every time we see him walking around in this compound, and because of the things that he did on earth. So, we need to continue celebrating this extraordinary life of a man, was a gallant man who devoted his life to selfless service through inclusion and higher education. I hope through continued work everywhere, we can see the equity and inclusion in higher education that we should not end by his passing, especially in UPU. But instead, John Spirit will live on in the daily acts of these tens of thousands of people he impacted like yourselves. Uh, anybody who was not impacted by Professor Johnny Tambrick, stand up. Anybody who was impacted, put up your hands. Uh, all of us. <laughs> so he impacted us and, uh, and, and it's, it, it's, we should pay back, especially the alumni. Grow the university so that we don't have to, 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 st to stay wh wherever we are. So soon you'll be watching uh, uh, videos. Uh, one is from Professor Kabudi, but the one that you also enjoy, uh, you hear some people, because when he passed, a lot of us talked, but there were many people. Professor Johnny Tambrech was global. You'll hear voices uh, of people he impacted, people he influenced. Uh, in the US, uh, Becca Magua is a doctor in Canada. Dr. Opio Lawyer, you read his articles every Wednesday. Uh, he's a professor in the University of Canada. We, know, we all know Mr. Andrew Monda. Uh, here, our own associate professor, Nesma Simugeni. His students at Makerere University, especially Mr. Alan Kasuja, the senior correspondent at BBC. Professor Kamere Mbote, he's doing some such great work in Kenya. And Dr. Monica Mhoja. Uh, and uh, this is how great John was. He was not a small as I to say. He was a big man, a very influential man, and we really value. And this is just a sample because we could not be here the whole day and the whole night if we had to record each one of us. But let's hear from what people are saying. I'm about to finish, and I, uh, he's looking at his watch. Uh, though we miss him, we miss his great shining example, and indomitable spirit of all times that he inspired us to go on. And we shall keep his vision alive through each small act action we take towards more inclusive and equitable higher education. I thought he would clap because uh, <laughs> no, I'm not the gentleman from Ministry of Education. Anyway, um, I think I need to stop. I could go on and on. 46 years, I could go on and on. But let me stop here and, uh, and, and call my boss and introduce Dr. Maggie Kigozi, our chancellor uh, uh, now for the second year. Uh, Ms. <coughs> Dr. Professor Dr. Maggie Kigozi is such a powerful woman. Being here alone is uh, so instrumental. It's a professional doctor. As a widow, who also dealt with it, is a business consultant, is a seasoned educator with extensive experience, in professional leadership, entrepreneurship, and education. He has served on various boards of many, many illustrious institutions in Uganda, and it is therefore with great respect, Madam, that I invite you to come over here and share a fragment of your wisdom with us. I thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. And John please let us stand up. The Chancellor is up. <laughs> please. Thank you, thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor Pelosi, Tambirwechi. I am so honored to stand here as the Chancellor 
of UPU. I have a clap, yes. <laughs> Any ministers, our members of parliament, our prime minister of Toro, we are so honored. Um, the chairman, council, and council, um, and all part of family, there's a lot of family around, and of course our illustrious alumni, those from Kenya, I lived there for many years, you're particularly welcome, but our alumni from all over, and our students. Uh, thank you very much for filling this tent in respect of a man that truly deserves it. The theme today, after hearing the, the two speakers before me, after hearing Chairman, uh, Chairman Council and also Pelosi, really shows what Professor John Tambelequi was. He was big, not only physically, because even physically, sounds like he was very big. <laughs> But also, he was big. I mean, how do you tell the Cuban government that I'm going for a drink? <laughs> yeah, not many of us would do that. We sit down peacefully and behave ourselves. But uh, he did that, and he has continued to do that all his life. Um, run a private university and allow many, many students to come in free of charge and pay partly, you know, that is special, that is special. We are business people and we know how special that is. We would no, probably not do it. But the topic, enhancing equity and access to higher education, addressing disparities and striving for inclusion really seems to describe the spirit of the man. And uh, so thank you very much for turning up. We want to specially thank our keynote speaker Professor Pamaga, Pamagamba John Aidan Kabudi, who will be with us online. Thank you very much uh, for coming, and uh, we are looking forward to listening to what you have to say. Our esteemed guests and cherished students and members of our academic community, today we come together to honor the legacy of the late Professor Tambi We come together to honor the legacy of the late professor. And that legacy for us here today is the UPU. This university that is changing lives. We've heard what the, the alumni have been doing. They've given us a few names that stand out, but they are all over the country. They are out there, uh, you know, uh, doing their work. And yet maybe they would never, never have achieved this without him and that vision of inclusivity. Uh, we really appreciate that part of him. Um, as we embark on this inaugural memorial lecture under the theme I read earlier, we find ourselves at a crucial juncture in the pursuit of knowledge and enlightenment. Professor Tambirechi dedicated his life to dismantling barriers that hindered the accessibility of higher education. So in honoring his memory, let us reaffirm our collective responsibility to continue the noble cause of promoting equity and inclusion within our academic community. Uh, the Ministry of Education is here with us. They are striving, and we shall hear from, from them when they are ready. But the private sector is here. We are here. Um, what is it that we can do to give access to all and not just the lucky few that can afford? By addressing disparities head on and fostering an environment that embraces diversity, we not only pay homage to Professor Antambiroki's vision, but also pave the way for a brighter, more inclusive future for all aspiring minds. Let this memorial lecture catalyze change, inspire us to redouble our efforts in creating an educational landscape that welcomes every individual, 
regardless of their background, into the transformative po power of higher education. Education is power. Education is the equalizer. Once you've graduated from here, you are no better or no worse than your fellow graduates. It is the equalizer. And Professor Ntambi really stood for that. He really believed in that. So together, we can build a legacy that honors Professor Ntambi tireless advocacy for a truly equitable and accessible education experience. I want to particularly thank my sister, Pelosi Tambirechi. We worked together. I was chairperson of Uganda Women's Efforts to Save Orphans, and I had the most wonderful executive director. She truly was. You haven't seen anything yet, <laughs> Madame Lumonia, because she was it. We traveled, we, went, we traveled many places, we saw many things. I learned so much from her. And then she went on to the UN and has been all over the world. And now, guess what? She's standing in the steps of that big man. <laughs> Pelosi will need all our support. I want to hear from all of you. At no point are you going to let Pelosi down and therefore John Tamiroki down. So let us move our university as high as it, he wanted it to go by not being discriminating. Let's allow the ones who need the education to also get it. The ones who can afford it can also come. And so we welcome everyone because this is the university that equalizes everyone. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Join me to thank the Chancellor. Let us really even clap as she goes back. Hey. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Maggie Kigozi. Thank you very much. Um, your speech was uh, succinct and uh, deeply um, to the point. Once again, we welcome the Prime Minister of Toro Kingdom. Thank you so much for gracing this uh, uh, ceremony. Um, as we move forward, based on our program, um, somebody last November said that um, if we tabulate the amount of money that uh, was waived in terms of uh, tuition. The tuition here is probably, I don't know, in a year or two or three, about uh, 1.5 billion shillings. So UPU is the only university in East Africa that does not build to get. It builds to give. When you look at 1.5 billion, estimated to be the amount of money in terms of tuition for a gone, you notice that uh, this model is real. We thank the alumni. We ask you to come on board. As the Chancellor has spoken, if we do not help Professor Antambirechi Pelsi, we will be negating our responsibility. And uh, Professor Pelsi said that he sees Professor Ntambirechi moving around. I don't know that today he's in which corner, but uh, he's seeing us and he will catch us. So let us support the university. Let us support the university. Thank you very, very much once again for our speakers. Uh, Dr. Uh, Karema, thank you very much. We probably need to link you up with a, a guy called Ashraf Semogere. He's a playwright. He can really make a good pal magic movie to really tell the world that this story, you know how they write? The story is based on a true, this movie is based on a true story. So we really need to put into writing some of these very inspiring uh, uh, stories. 
and uh, thank you for keeping uh, the spirit of friendship because not many people believe that uh, you must keep a friendship. You simply say, when the reasons under which we contracted the friendship are no longer binding, there is no more reason for us to continue engaging because it might be detrimental to each one of us, but particularly from the former beneficiary. So, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to um, uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Arthur Benomjisha from uh, Accord to come and give us a grounding, put us into um, the essence of this uh, um, event. Um, Dr. Arthur, they have told me you have big shoes. I don't know. But uh, those shoes, after you have uh, spoken, you are at liberty to invite or nominate a person to invite, but I think you should invite because you can invite the uh, uh, Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Great uh, Toro Kingdom. Yes, uh, Dr. Arthur. Uh, thank you, MC, for today. Um, <clears throat> the Chancellor uh, of this great university, uh, Uganda Pentecostal University, Professor Dr. Maggie Chigozi, uh, the Chairman of the Council, Dr. Karima, the Vice Chancellor uh, of UPU, uh, Professor. Uh, board members represented here, council members, the Prime Minister of this mighty kingdom, Honorable Hunda, Member of Parliament, and, 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 and a distinguished uh, member of this university. Uh, my colleague uh, Onesimus Mujeni, uh, Professor Onesimus Mujeni, uh, Professor Onesimus Mujeni was made a professor from this university. Stand up for recognition. <laughs> and we work together at the mighty accord. Uh, yes, it is. But I'm not the best person to market it. Um, the staff of this university, uh, the students' body of this university, invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, I think this is the day that the Lord has made and we should rejoice and be glad in it. You receive it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, honestly, uh, so my name is Dr. Binomucha. I'm the executive director of ACCORD. Uh, Accord is a public policy research think tank based in Kampala but working in East and Southern Africa and the late Professor John Tamrechi was our chairperson from the inception up to when he passed on. Please recognize him. And under his leadership Accord rose in the ranks to become one of the leading think tanks in the world. We have been number one think tank in this country because we are ranked globally for over 10 years and we don't take that for granted we thank god for the leadership that stable leadership uh, i'll talk uh, 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 briefly about john and accord uh, we as an organization we see ourselves as a pro-democracy think tank and therefore we work to democratize promote transparency and accountability in the governance of these countries that are emerging democracies. It is not easy. So June paid a very big price uh, to keep a court afloat. I don't know how many times uh, the government <laughs> wanted to close us, uh, especially when we ventured in areas uh, that were not, uh, those days were not conventional. We asked 
had questions. Uh, now, this information I'm giving you is uh, uh, is a qualified privilege. I think the lawyers would say that so that it will stay, it will stay here. So if you are here and you are a journalist, this is of what? Of record. It is for John because I cannot keep it or die. Uh, 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 so if you are a government person, you are here. Well, of course, we are not anti-government, but we need to know the history and know the man. So a court sometimes, and you know the president also came to parliament, I said, a court has bribed the members of parliament. This is when we are pioneering on our work in promoting transparency and accountability in the oil exploration, when oil was being explored. And most of the production sharing agreements were not open. And we were pushing parliament and did government to open up. Because these production sharing agreements were not known to us here, but they were listed in London on the stock exchange. And, uh, uh, and of course of that, uh, we had a lot of friction, but we knew what we were doing. And several times, uh, uh, they would want to cross us, but John would go there and, uh, and, 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 and uh, assure the government that actually we are not, we are not subversive, we are just doing a noble job. Yes, I remember one time I was traveling out of the country. I was already in the, in the lounge at the airport, and the chairman of the NGO bureau called me and said, where are you? I said, I'm traveling out of the country. He said, if you don't come tomorrow and meet the minister for internal affairs, you are going to be closed. I was already in the lounge. And uh, anyway, of course, I called John. I called Onesimus and others. And Onesimus uh, and John and... He drove from here to meet, uh, to meet the, the Minister of Internal Affairs in the morning in Kampara. And, uh, and the court remained open. And, he, <laughs> and because the court has remained open, we have touched. A court has touched on all the laws and the policies on oil and gas governance of this country. If we have our footprint there. And of course, uh, that's why I want to recognize Onesimus. At Accord, he's our focal person. And we work very closely, of course, with now Minister of, uh, of Energy, uh, the, the, the oil companies, to make sure that we enact that the laws that this country has put in place on oil are transparent and accountable. But they are also implemented to the latter. And now, of course, over time, we build trust and confidence. So we work very, very, very well with government and oil companies to the extent that now we meet on a quarterly basis to hold each other accountable. We hold government to account, and we hold companies to account, and they also hold us to account. And honestly, I appreciate that because and that came from John. So John should take that credit. Uh, John, uh, to me, uh, as a chair of Accord, you know, inspired a lot of us. I was a defender of our vision, but he was a Pan-Africanist. John was a Pan-Africanist. He did not look at his family, at his uh, clan, at his tribe, at his country. He was a Pan-Africanist. And that's why you have Kenya here. You have, And actually, uh, may, I should do say this, uh, you can qualify it. He touched on most of the environmental laws of the countries in West Africa. Drafted the environmental laws. And no one in accord, our environment and natural resources governance program is a top. And that's, of course, the influence uh, of John. Uh, John, uh, which is personal to me, he was a Msingo, a great Msingo. Hey, he was a great Msingo, a giant, a towering Msingo. Aba Msingo Muraha. Na nili chweka genda nili msi mkono. Na u deli chweka those whose mother, half, half, 50%. So John was a Msingo. And I am a single, and it's a coincidence. Don't think that actually you put in a code a single. Coincident, we met, I met John at actually university, in Makere University. I was not interviewed by Brondelon, so I finished my memory. I met him, and actually we were on the opposite side. Uh, Professor Tambridge was supporting the restoration of the kingdom in Ankole, and I was opposed to the restoration of the kingdom. But both of us were very close friends. I was very close to Prince Valichi. I worked with him but as a member of parliament for Kasha. But when he wanted to be a king, I said, ah, uh -uh. Because you see,
June had forgotten nothing and learned nothing. Because they were single, we were always rivaling. <laughs> they, in Ankore, not here, we were always rivaling. Because they were single, first ruled, were overthrown by the Bachwezi. So, but anyway, uh, I, I, uh, uh, me and June now were on the opposing side. And, uh, but later on, we agreed. And we became friends. He became, I think to me, John is a, is a mentor. He was older than me, but he saw me as his brother. And therefore, his children are my uncle. And he told you this. Yeah, uh, but, he, but also, they were single in this region. There are people who, had, who suffered a lot of violations, human rights violations. In Angola, they said they stopped people from resurrection. They said, how powerful are these people who can stop others from resurrecting? In Vunyoro, they were even pushed out to Congo. There was a, a, a violation of their rights. In, so they have been controversial, but I'm happy that in Toro, they were then promoted. Of course, uh, they, uh, Mr. Katuram was the first prime minister when the kingdom was restored here in the Zemsingo. A proud Katuram, ladies and gentlemen. He was Zemsingo here. He started the kingdom when they were restored in 19, uh, in, uh, in 92, 93. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> John was a distinguished lawyer and demystified the law. You know the lawyers are a bit proud people. Uh, but John made law easy, and I think the people we wonder, most of them are lawyers. <laughs> people I meet, they are lawyers. He made law easy, he made law uh, uh, humble, and I think and I think really we need to give a round of applause to John for demystifying the law and the legal profession. But what is interesting is that people who studied at half, my children also passed here, half, 500. Hey, those of us he supported, when they went to the LODC in Makerere, they were the best. Can you imagine? Yes, we have a standing at the LODC uh, for best performing students from this university. So I don't take, and I was always worried. I knew that LODC would, would actually test the court of students, and they have demonstrated that, and I thank God for John. Uh, I'm born again. Uh, <clears throat> I'm born again, and I don't fear, I am not to say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I, and I, John is in heaven, I preached to John. I laid my hands to John many times. I anointed John. There's a time, you know, even through his sickness, even his doctor, I'm told, he remarked, what type of a person are you? He would go in, then come out, and start his life very well. Uh, and I think uh, God was always with him. But I laid several times hands on John. And look, he's older, but I laid hands on and he respected me. And he inspired me uh, to do my PhD. And of course, paid my tuition at the University of Bradford in England. Uh, so he paid. I am here as a, an expert in peace and security because of John. And I've not only used that, I've taught in Makere University many years. I may have been having some of you here, masters, uh, students. I teach at Uganda Christian University, so I'm a senior lecturer. But I have also mediated in very violent conflicts. I have drafted agreements that have ended wars, one, South Sudan which ended the war between UPDF and White Army, but also uh, between the government. So I, I cannot forget that that PhD has been put into use. So I want to thank John. Uh, of course, Onesimus is also my, uh, they sponsored me. An institution to sponsor you to be a PhD is not a simple uh, achievement. And the PhD that has been used, isn't it? Uh, I want to end because uh, 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 John wanted to be a president of the Republic of Uganda. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's why he ran into many problems. Uh, uh, John, you know, John hated the security of Benaisa. Yes, he hated the security of President Benaisa. But also when he ran to exile and he was not, uh, uh, he, he had these intentions. He reached out to General Moses Ali. Uh, to make an alliance uh, their, with their own rebel outfit. I, I wish that, uh, that Moses R was here. That one you didn't know? Okay. Now, now, now you know. Because now, John, you can't arrest him. You can't. <laughs> it's just, I 
and of course he's in heaven. He's at the balcony of heaven looking at us, smiling. So, so John wanted to be a president of the Republic of Uganda, and, uh, and uh, he had all it takes to be a president and more. And uh, I remember when he, declared, when he declared, and then he withdrew it, he said, I think we had a high-level policy dialogue at Serena. And he said, let me say this, <laughs> at least, and I want to be arrested. I am now old. Uh, he said, I wanted to be president of the Republic of Uganda, but now I have withdrawn it. I no longer have interest. <laughs> I am now old and I have retreated to start a university and I think he used most of his time that uh, the energy, the brilliance that he wanted to use to steer this country, transform this country to build this university and he made it a university of the people. <laughs> I want to thank him uh, uh, for that. So, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as a code, we have participated, we have co-hosted this together. We put some resources. Uh, uh, the, 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 next, the keynote speaker is our board member. And uh, maybe uh, he will introduce me, but he's a, is that interesting. He's also John, Professor John Kabudi Paramagambo. He's a professor of law uh, from the University of Dar es Salaam and got a first class. And he has also been our board member, uh, uh, Onesimus, I think, for, for as long. He has been with us for a long, long time. And, uh, and he has been a Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs of Tanzania, and then a Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, when he now is a member of Parliament. He's a distinguished person, and he is born again. He's a born again. And that has seen him uh, wrong. But above all, he fought, and that one you will not say it. So let me say it, and I, I conclude. He fought in the liberation struggle that removed Idi Amin from power up to Koboko. So he was a Mkombozi. And uh, he said, if you see some of the brown people uh, in the north, they could be my children. But that time he hadn't <laughs> given his life to us. So ladies and gentlemen, let's enjoy John. Let's uh, take the vision that John stood for and, uh, and, uh, and transform this country. The best thing you can give your children is education. But the best thing you can give them is good education. At UPU, Chancellor, Vice Chancellor and the team, our aim is to make it accessible, inclusive, but quality. Thank you very much, and God bless. Uh, oh, it is my single uh, honor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for reminding me to invite, to invite. Yes, the, the right honorable prime minister of the mighty Kingdom of Toro to speak to us. Give him a round of applause. Yes. Good day, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there's a lot of protocol here, but let me start with Madame Pelusi. Yes, Pelusi, uh, you're such an inspiring person. I want also to recognize our Honorable Maggie, Dr. Maggie Chigozi. Uh, Dr. Maggie Chigozi was my doctor. I don't know whether she remembers that. <laughs> when we had just started the government, she's, we had a small room at Parliament. I think it was every Wednesday or something. It was voluntary, I guess. You're paid, okay. She's sit at Parliament and uh, we would go there and so she treated me more than a couple of times. So, Madam, you're most welcome. Professor... I want to observe really all protocols. Honorable Alex Ruhunda, Nick Sovoka, Nick Chasovoka. Um, all the past speakers, please, I want to write on the already established protocol uh, for in the interest of time. Um, I am, let me first introduce myself probably, probably, properly. 
I was born in this village, down here, Maguru, Itara. I was born here. And uh, fate can be very funny that I was born here. I retired two years, three, almost three years ago now. And I'm a prime minister in my village of the entire kingdom of Toro. So I want to thank God for that, that uh, what you've just said, the education is an equalizer, but death too is an equalizer. I want to thank God that um, <clears throat> things can happen if we are diligent and we pursue our goals. I recently heard someone talk about ignoring small fights and concentrating on the bigger battles. I want to thank all of you here who have put away the smaller considerations in your life and concentrated on the bigger issues of your life. And education is one of such bigger issues. The young people who are in the university, this is time to really let go of all encumbrances and concentrate and focus and you will be equal with everybody else. I had come here, I had prepared my, my speech in Kiswahili because I have served in Tanzania at two different postings for 12 years. I was in Tanzania as a first secretary at the Uganda High Commission in 1990 to 1995. Then I went to other places, and my last posting before I retired was again in Tanzania as minister councillor in the same embassy. So I had prepared my speech in Kiswahili to impress Professor Kabudi. <laughs> I know he, he might be online, and I want him to hear this. Mwishimiwa Kabudi, mimi na jivunia Kiswahili nicho jifunza, inchi ya Tanzania. Nchienu ya Tanzania ni inchi marufu sana, ni inchi nzuri ambayo emeji tolea kama inchi tulivu, inchi ambayo ena mambo mengi yanayofanyika kwa uzuri pamoja na watanzania wote kuwa na umoja na uzalendo kwa inchi yao. Hiyo kidogo mwishimi wa kabudi ndiyo likuwa nataka nijivunia hapa, ungekuwa upo hapa na sisi hapa. As a, a prime minister... As a Prime Minister of Toro, I am very impressed, one, by the illustrious career and life of Professor Ntambirweki. I did not have opportunity to interact with him a lot, but certainly I think he's a person to emulate. His pursuit of equity and inclusion in education is a very noble um, pursuit. And I guess all of us here need to have uh, the same um, trajectory in your, in your lives, not to hold knowledge and understanding. As I said in the beginning, let us put aside smaller encumbrances in life and pursue the bigger goals in life so that we can impact society. As Toro Kingdom, and on behalf of King Oyo, we are very proud to have hosted, or to continue to host, uh, this university. I want to applaud those who have started the Professor Ntambirweki Foundation. I think the most important pursuit right now is to find a permanent home for the university. And I think you can do that. You can do that because I see Dr. Ntambirweki pursued things and changed the world, West Africa, Europe, Cuba, everywhere. I think there is a lot of opportunity for you who are going to be members of the Ntambirweki Foundation to use that membership, to use all your association with Dr. Ntambirweki, Professor Ntambirweki, to pursue finding a permanent home for UPU. It is doable. It can be done with you if you can see what the man stood for and what his dear wife stands for and what all of you 
have stood for hand in hand with Professor Ntambiruechi. My question to us all is, you have heard the legacy of Dr. Ntambiruechi, Professor Ntambiruechi. What is your legacy? When you finally cease to, have to exist, what will people stand up and talk about you? That's a very legitimate question for all of us to ask this day. When you die, what will people learn about your life? What have you achieved? What have you done in your life? I think it's important that all of us begin to see the real bigger issues in our life. Abantu batoro ni to twine kizibu icho kurwana obulemo obutaito taito obutaito taito obutaito taito eh kuikara ntumara obwire na amani gaitu kurwana okurwana okutaito we don't have to fight small fights there will always be differences between you there is god did not create us the same but we must have the fortitude to be able to ad, uh, accommodate one another have differences but differences in unity. I want to really um, encourage you, especially the people who are going to be spearheading the Professor Ntambiruweki Foundation, that you should think big and pursue. You will not get everything at a go, but you will build a foundation for the greater things to come. Um, I am also very religious. I am an elder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I fear God and I love people. Uh, Nelson Mandela once said that a good heart and a big brain is a force to reckon with. Let us cultivate good heart towards mankind. Let us pursue our goals, individual, but within the context of everyone else. Like uh, uh, UPU says, equity and inclusion. We should always have equity and inclusion with everyone who comes our way. Really, I don't have much to say, just to introduce my people with whom I'm present here with, uh, today. Uh, there is a lady who I call a, a pioneer. In Toro culture and traditions, a lady has never been appointed a prime minister. But we have a pioneer in Toro by the name of Right Honorable Harriet Nyakake, who is my deputy. Abuori, can you stand up, please? I also have with me today our Speaker of Parliament. We call it Orkurato. Engineer Mwirumubi, please stand up for recognition. We have our administrator of the kingdom, Mr. Tom Mugara. Do we have anybody else present here from our kingdom? Those are the ones. So with all those few remarks, I want to thank you all, all the, the people that have spoken. Like I said, I want to follow all the protocol. I want to thank you, and I want to give one singular message. Let work towards a permanent home for UPU, please start now for God and my country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the speakers in this segment. Uh, right Honorable Prime Minister, your deputy, the administrator, and the speaker of a uh, uh, the Toro Kingdom Parliament, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to be here with us. But also, who are we to welcome you in your own home? It is us who should thank you for having invited us today and in the time that Professor Ntambirechi was here two decades ago. Uh,
Madam Olive Lumonya I'm uh, the permanent uh, home is largely on your shoulders uh, Professor Pelsi your duty is to coordinate and I think you have started pointing at the land uh, the alumni from Kenya, uh, you know, they have a bit of money and they are generous. Maybe even by the time they live here, they are going to call all their friends and say there is a crisis. The crisis is a shortage of enough money. So I think it is an important opportunity as we shall launch the foundation that uh, as the Prime Minister has said, this must now be the the call, the clarion call, it is the mission. It is the mission, and I think we shall not forget it because this mission has been uh, dedicated at the first uh, memorial uh, lecture. Um, I have been uh, informed that uh, uh, the uh, chairman LC5 is not uh, present, but... Uh, when he had online, he sent a message and requested Honorable Alex uh, Ruhunda to be the prime beneficiary of his time. <laughs> uh, in Luganda, we say, Chisoboka, Chirisoboka, Era Chisoboka. Uh, Honorable Alex Ruhunda, we welcome you, and after you have spoken, we will have a um, 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 uh, tribute to Professor Antambirechi. It is a 30 minute video. We'll do half now and then another half later on. Uh, Honorable, you are welcome. Normally, the politicians do not carry big papers, but uh, they really do a good job in educating us, and we are about to go through a lecture of uh, the gospel according to Honorable Alex. <laughs> uh, the MC has really hyped me. I don't know whether I will live to the standard. Um, The Chancellor of this great university, the Chair of the Council, the Vice Chancellor, and all the, the members. Actually, we have the members of the board uh, for the university. I happen to be one. So, so now I am officially introducing myself. <laughs> and. Uh, our religious leaders, the Prime Minister, Toro Kingdom, and your deputy, and all our cultural leaders who are present, distinguished scholars, because we have the professors, doctors, academia is here, uh, some of us, we keep talking from the voters, so now I have to change my, my quality of discourse because I'm now with the top cream uh, of the country. So the alumni and of course the, stud the student leaders who are here, Everybody who is attached to UPU in your respective capacities. Uh, firstly, I would like to appreciate our dear Vice Chancellor uh, for really making sure that I appear here today. I like to appreciate you very much because you really kept me in the loop and you made sure I come. And being my mother, MC Takati, I could not really refuse. Actually, I now put off the whole week 
because we have a series of activities here. So I said now I will not be in Kampala until we are done with the duty of this university. Today we are talking about a great man who was a very, very unique character by, by African standards. Because what I have got to know, meeting an independent-minded person who is strong-willed within our context, is not easy to come by. But Professor Ntambirwechi, he was a really strong character. I think the Ultraman, I, I, this one I'm now proud of putting it on, because we are talking about the real Ultraman. Me, I'm a Pan-Africanist. And I have a big quarrel, of course, with my brother, uh, who is talking of born again and so on. That is another subject. Uh, because I don't understand when we talk about that language. Uh, for me, as a Pan-Africanist, I know that we, we have enemies to fight. And those enemies are known historically. Because people who took us into slavery made us suffer for centuries. They have gone on to set systems and designs of controlling our human and natural resources. They have kept systems that create instability on our continent. And they make sure we don't unify as Africans. Those enemies are still at large and very big, and I only need to know my identity and know that we have a cause to fight. And this cause, it needs us to understand our identity as black people. So for me, that is very clear. So of course, I won't go into that rough terrain. When I met uh, Professor Antambirwechi, he was a very intimidating character. So the first time we, came, we met, and the way how he behaved, because he had just appointed me uh, to be a member of the university council. I was heading a research institute which I founded, KRC Uganda. So the first time I we went, and the way how he was taking himself, I said, my God, am I going to manage this man? So, but I took time to understand why, why is this man behaving the way he does? So, I, I picked interest to know him. Shockingly, he had a very, very big weakness. And that was his soft spot was really the feel for people trying to see how to help people who are in need. He had that soft spot. So I could not believe because you find men who have made it, especially lawyers, finding lawyers who are really having philanthropic causes. It's hard to come by because I know your profession and they know what you do. But for Professor Tandrewechi to have such a large heart that is so merciful and so empathetic, to me that moved me. And I really became his friend in his own, because I also love being, uh, being mad sometimes. I love that madness which people don't understand. So I, 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 we became, we connected because you see, People with large brains, when they are confronted with all these inequalities that you see in the world, and you know you have a big word fight, you have to carve out your character and know your path and know how 
to move. Otherwise, if you go by the general setup, you will never, you will be frustrated completely. So he carved out his niche, and we are here because of what he did. Because he had to come out and say, I need a free space where I can exercise my wisdom, knowledge, and I can transform these human beings. And indeed, he did that. Now, interestingly, yesterday, I, I, wa I was uh, presiding over the road safety event by the Diocese of Ruenzori. And the Bishop of Ruenzori Diocese was there. So I told him, Bishop, you know I'm the, the chairperson, Parliamentary Forum for Road Safety, and I was also elected chairperson African legislatures on road safety because we mind about lives. So I told the bishop, because I lost bishop, we lost bishop Chalgonza. And then I told bishop Ruben, and I said, you know, tomorrow there is a very important lecture I cannot miss. And I, he asked me which one. I said, we are going to remember our great man, Professor John Intanbrueki. And uh, when in his uh, remark, he told me that, you know, that man sucked me. He gave me a job. He gave me a job and then sucked me. <laughs> and he said, even, do you know how he did it? He came to my office and he told me from now on what they have sucked you. <laughs> because <laughs> the bishop had wanted... <laughs> The bishop was trying to impose his values on the Professor Tadruek, like how Dr. Mugisha wants to tell us to be born again. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor said, I have given you a, I gave you a job and you come to lecture me on how to run my affairs and even my personal life. Now you are sacked. And he sacked the bishop. <laughs> so that is Professor <laughs> Tadruek. So I really enjoyed... Um, uh, his character. So, we discussed, of course now, today, some of us who really struggle to liberate our color. You know we are captured. You know, you know when you are trying to get captives, people are so captured, they, they cannot see the bigger picture. You find people so much in the tribes. You find them in the clans. You find them in re, in religious sectors. They are so so. By the way, actually, when we did our analysis, we found that because I was sharing with the professor. Now, these these are the issues which we were brainstorming. How how do we liberate these people? They have captured them intellectually. They are captured spiritually then they, 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 they can even lynch you if you come out to tell them that you are lost. Now, how do we do that? Of course, for, for him, he said, I just said UPU. But I said, you know, it, it is Pentecostal. <laughs> I was just talking. <laughs> it is Pentecostal. And you, and you promoting Pentecostalism, the American dominance. <laughs> uh, and then he said, no, 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 no. But this is a very good vehicle where when we get people to realize their rights, liberate their brains, make them understand their rights of existence on this earth. So if UPU gives them that, I would have played my part. And I believe that that's why I'm comfortable a board member of UPU and I will serve with one heart. So we have one big challenge. How come we have nurtured so many human resources through education, but we are not catching up with the other continents? What is it that the other people did if you look at the Chinese 
what did they do to come and capture the world? So what is the problem? Is it the education system we are having? Because I'm now facing these, these experts, now I can look at them very well in the eyes. What, what, what is the problem? How come we have to go and still beg foreigners to extract our resources and even in the process of extracting our resources, we are donating to them. You mean we didn't go to school? So we the elites, what is our problem? And we are in charge of the country. And we make laws. And we feel we are independent since 1962. So these are the issues which we have been grappling with. And on this day, it would be rightful in the memory of our professor because for him, he did not like lamentations. He only moves to fix. So his brain was so special that it was a fixer brain. Not a brain that would give excuses because there are some people who are good critics. They critique, they make very powerful speeches, but they are not fixers. That's not helpful. But the professor did. He fixed. And that's why we welcomed here in the Toro. I'm so happy that in Imbarara, you did not get land. <laughs> because in Imbarara, you have had your big share. <laughs> from the National Cake Outlook. <laughs> so I am so... <laughs> so here, we are so happy that land was not found. We are equally happy that there was a group which had the premises where Professor Ntambruek landed and nurtured this baby who has grown. So we are very happy. So it is our prayer as leaders because the vision which we have for this place is to make it the educational hub of Africa. So Fort Porto to be the educational hub of Africa. That's the vision we are pursuing. So it is our duty to support institutions of this type. It is on record. It is on record that we donated land for Mountains of the Moon University as a local government which used to sit here. Where Mountains of the Moon University is seated in Saka, that the, the councillors led by the former LOC5, Kayonga by then, they sat and made a resolution to give the district land for the cause of Mountains of the Moon University. So if you have these intellectually liberating entities, institutions, it is still our duty, Mr. Prime Minister, it is our duty to look for land and donate to UPU. Because UPU is a, a transformative human capital development institution that we must protect jealously. So making individuals carry a burden of this nature when they are providing a public service that is extremely essential is really not right. So for me, that is the spirit. That is the speed for, for, for the first for, for the first time a politician has received the money and has not given <laughs> I take it with one heart. Finally Madame Chigozi, you know 
This is the Fort Porto Tourism City. The whole of Uganda. We are proud having the name Fort Porto Tourism City. And it is very clear. I don't know whether you have spent a night here or you have just arrived. You spent a night. And I'm sure that when you spent a night, you covered yourself and had a good sleep. Because this climate in the whole world, it's the only conducive climate where you can come and sleep without any inconvenience from the climate perspective. So we have one of the most beautiful, throughout the year we are like this. So nobody can fail to come and learn from here and be an innovator and be a useful human being. So we think that this partnership, we've got to establish a partnership between the, the UPU and Fort Porto Tourism City. So I'm going to, to, to take lead to make sure that we build this partnership because it is through this kind of linkage. What we need is sharpening the brains of our technocrats. We have to change the mindset of our people for them to understand the importance of working for the common good that should develop this nation. And we can only do that when we expose them to knowledge that works. And I think this is what we will work here together. So I'm here to support you. I'm equally here as a strong believer in my, my great professor who passed on. But as you know, the difference between us, the Africans and the Europeans, is that for them, when they build institutions and discover knowledge, that knowledge is entirely owned by the next generation that comes. They don't discard, they only improve and own. And this is the culture which we need to adopt here. If we want to be competitive globally, we must know that, yes, your time is here for a, a period, but your legacy will remain for generations and generations to come. So the onus is on us who are here to ensure that the legacy of Professor Ntandruechi continues and he will continue to live in us and in our great-grandchildren because what he has established is something that can never expire. So now that all of you, you have come here, that is the resolution you have made to go and ensure this legacy remains, the knowledge bases remain and we continue transforming and intellectually liberating our people. I thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. A round of applause. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Ruhunda, Alex. I am happy that uh, you spoke like the Prime Minister. You re-echoed his words, but you simply paraphrased them. <laughs> he gave, the Prime Minister told us differences in unity. Approach, the mission is, is one. The mission is one. So, right Honorable Prime Minister, your citizen has really celebrated your statement and guidance. And when the Prime Minister normally speaks, he's giving a directive. And uh, it is only from a kingdom like Toro that mangoes can come and fall on the whole of UPU in the form of land. <laughs> and we will pray that we live to see that day. We will live to see that day. All those who will live when that day comes will say that those who lived when the day was proposed to come one day really did a good, 
good thing. Do we have members of the fourth estate here, the media? Uh, uh, why don't you come here? Members of the, the, the media, please come forward. You are the miracles of society. And uh, what is also interesting about the media, please, at the very front, the media in uh, Fort Porto is largely UPU alumni. I would like the media to, to come forward. Is the president of the society here today? Oh, okay. But ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, asked the media to come forward because a day like this requires to be represented as it is. The good views deliberated here. The Prime Minister has told us the small things are not what we should go for. So before you write Honorable Prime Minister, uh, the media is here. Uh, when we used to teach media, we would say that uh, the good news is the one which the people don't want to, to hear. And they call it angle. Eh? Ah, the angle. Whereas in geometry we say congruence, that the size and shape must be the same. So I am appealing to members here through Honorable Runda that uh, the media become people of geometry. And they report exactly the same thing. And it is only through you that the world will know that we need land for UPU. It is only you who reaches every office in the land. You have pens and now you have, uh, you use typewriters? No, 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 no. Keyboard. Keyboard. Please help the legacy of Professor Antambirechi. How many are alumni of UPE? UPU rather. You are finished. Just do the right thing. I thank you very much. Mzee has guided me that uh, I have spoken very well. And he really didn't want to live here without uh, telling me. So, I am really blessed. <laughs> and I don't want to share my joy with you, but I will at uh, a later time. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I thank all our speakers that uh, have uh, uh, spoken to us this morning. I now want to take the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker. I hope Professor is online. De? No, he's, he has a video, but he's also online. So it is two things. Yes, he's online, he wants to hear himself. But he also wants to, and he has confirmed that he will be here on Saturday in person. We can clap for him for being here in voice. We also have about 150 people online, which is almost our number here. Um, Professor Palamagamba John Aiden Mwaluko Kabudi. Professor Kabudi is a respected academic. is a respected uh, academic, an accomplished scholar, a passionate politician, and a devoted church member and advisor. He is a law professor with expertise in the field of Professor Ntambirechi, international law and human rights law. Professor Kabudi has published several academic articles 
and research papers and has contributed to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, the International Criminal Court, and the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Professor Kabudi is a member of the Parliament of the United Republic of Tanzania. He is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and also a former Minister Oh, former, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation, and twice as Minister for Constitutional and Legal Affairs. Professor Kabudi is a lay canon in the Anglican Church of Tanzania and served as a Synod member and registrar of the Church. Arthur. Professor Kabudi has also served as professor and dean of the Faculty of Law and as the secretary of the University Council of the University of Dar es Salaam. He was also involved with several local, he has been involved with several local and international organizations and initiatives, including ACCORD, the African Union the United Nations, and the East African community. Professor Kabudi is a holder of LLB First Class Honors, LLM, and also a doctorate from uh, Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, join me on screen to listen to the video recorded by Professor Kabudi in his full embodiment as an orator excellent friend of Professor John Intambirechi, an East African and an honored citizen of this globe. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, cherished friends, it is both an honor and solemnly privilege to extend a heartfelt welcome to each of you as we gather for this inaugural Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, cherished friends, it is both an honor and... Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, cherished friends, it is both an honor and solemnly privilege to extend a heartfelt welcome to each of you as we gather for this inaugural Professor John Tabirechi Memorial Lecture on this significant 12th day of February 2024. Today we stand united in remembrance and celebration, commemorating the enduring legacy of a remarkable individual. It has been precisely 10 months since we bid farewell to my brother, my confidant, and our esteemed compatriot, Professor John Tambirechi. It is always an esteemed privilege to visit Uganda and travel to the wonderful tourism city, Fort Porto. Due to unforeseen circumstances, with my parliamentary schedules, I'm unable to join you this morning. Equally, it is a profound honor to deliver the keynote address on a matter of paramount significance, titled Enhancing Equity and Access to Higher Education, Addressing Disparities and Striving for Inclusion. In honoring his memory, we not only pay tribute to his exceptional contribution, but to also celebrate the profound impact he left on our lives and within our academic and the societal spheres. As we embark on this solemn yet inspiring journey of remembrance and reflection, let us carry forward the spirit of his intellectual curiosity. 
his unwavering dedication to excellency, and his profound commitment to advancing knowledge and fostering positive change. May this inaugural lecture serve as a beacon of remembrance, enlightenment, and inspiration as we honor the life and legacy of Professor John Tabirechi. Welcome, one and all, to this momentous occasion. Allow me to tell you about the John Tabirechi I knew, a figure whose impact resonates deeply with our hearts and minds. Who was this remarkable individual? And what was the essence of the man I had the privilege to know? Professor John Tambirechi was a beacon of intellect, compassion, and vision. He was not only, he was not merely a colleague or an acquaintance. He was a cherished friend, a mentor, and a guiding light. In our shared journey, I witnessed firsthand his unwavering commitment to excellency, his insatiable thirst for knowledge, and his boundless generosity of spirit. He was a scholar of profound depth, whose insights transcended the confines of academia, enriching the lives of all who had the privilege to engage with him. But beyond his scholarly achievements, Professor John Tambirechi was a man of integrity and kindness, whose presence illuminated every room he entered. To know Professor John Tambirechi was to be touched by his wisdom, inspired by his passion, and uplifted by his unwavering belief in the power of education to transform lives. He was a man of many facets, a teacher, a mentor, a friend. But above all, he was a beacon of light whose legacy will continue to illuminate our path long after he has departed from this world. Needless, needless to say, education plays a critical role in eradicating poverty and steering the vision for prosperous and sustainable development for any country. Education saves lives, improves health, and fosters shared understanding and values. As access and quality in higher education systems worldwide continue to improve, the important policy objective of equity and inclusion has become a central, of, become a central focus. This calls for fresh perspectives and the proactive measures to shape the future transformation of higher education. I applaud the courageous decision my brother and friend, the late Professor John Tambirechi, in building the Uganda Pentecostal University, UPU, based in Fort Porto City in Western Uganda, offering courses in various disciplines. From the report I used to receive from my brother and friend, UPU has transformed the lives of many students from the underprivileged backgrounds through the university bursary scheme in Western Uganda especially. I would like us all to always appreciate him for his visionary leadership and commitment and to assure that all people from any background can attain an education. Indeed, education in, is an equalizer of such young people who had no or little hope of accessing higher learning. To understand the need to provide equity and access to higher education, the 2018 World Development Report and the 2016 Global Education Monitoring Report by UNESCO 2016 have made it clear education is also a foundation block for nearly every other sustainable development goal, SDG. SDG 4 advocates for equal access by, any, by all gender to all forms of higher education and the elimination of disparities to ensure equal access to all levels of education and vocational training for the vulnerable, including persons with disabilities, vulnerable people, and children in resource poor situations. SDG 4, therefore, aims at ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and pro pro promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. The Global Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education was adopted at the 40th session of the UNESCO General Conference in November 2019 in order to facilitate academic mobility 
between countries and regions. It is the first legally binding United Nations Treaty on Higher Education with a global scope. Now let us look at challenges that liberty, equity and access uh, to education. The social economic status of students influence their participation in higher education, as well as in vocational and uh, technical education. Family income is another factor in identifying disadvantaged students as, a, as individuals from low-income households often face obstacles in pursuing higher, higher education. This challenge is particularly amplified in countries with high tuition fees and limited financial support, including publicly funded scholarships and government-backed student loans programs. Higher tuition fees challenge equity and inclusion potentially restricting the participation of students from disadvantages, disadvantaged backgrounds. Students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, migrant backgrounds, and students with chronic illness or disabilities, refugees, are largely underrepresented in higher education. Gender imbalances continue to exist, particularly in some disciplines. Moreover, Students from some underrepresented groups are more likely to discontinue their studies and leave higher education without a degree. With regard to education in Uganda, a country where the Uganda Pentecostal University is situated, female literacy rates continue to lag behind at 66.89% compared to 80.85% of males and the gender gaps widen at secondary and tertiary education. This is according to a report uh, of 2023. Having low literacy rates is one of the drivers of discrimination and the marginalization of women in Uganda, since they cannot equitably access service delivery programs and uh, intervention. Now, what should be done to enhance equity and access to higher education? One is fostering equity and the inclusion involves ensuring fair representation of students from diverse backgrounds in higher education, covering a spectrum of social, economic, ethnic, gender, physical, and mental uh, characteristics. As a result, it is imperative for countries to establish tailored frameworks for identifying and categorizing disadvantaged students within their respective societies. In countries with diverse ethnicities, Ensuring the access of ethnic minority students to higher education is paramount. Similarly, in countries with very varying religious affiliations, equitable access to higher education opportunities should be extended to students from religious minority, minority groups. There is a need for affirmative action in many countries to ensure equitable access to higher education. Top institutions must prioritize including students from diverse backgrounds, particularly those facing disadvantages as part of their social responsibilities. This requires policies to facilitate the recruitment of students from humble backgrounds, either through merit-based or quota-based admissions uh, processes. Balancing merit-based and quota-based mechanisms is in the recruitment of students is essential to guarantee more significant equity and inclusion. As I conclude my lecture, now let me turn to recommendations to higher education institutions. One, integrate the goals of equitable access and successful participation for all learners into the institutional mission and develop specific objectives and strategies for achieving them. Two, work in partnership with government representatives of other education sectors civil society, professional associations, and employers in order to address issues of access and successful participation in a holistic manner, taking into consideration the outcomes of secondary level schooling, labor market trends, and the national development needs. Three, call for and participate in multi-stakeholder multi dialogue with government and all competent bodies to develop policies and ensure adequate financial support for the pursuit of, uh, of the access and success agenda. And uh, four, develop or strengthen admission 
policies and practices that emphasize the potential of each applicant and address equity of access and a successful participation by offering a variety of flexible learning pathways for entry and exit. The following are my recommendations to governments. Governments at all levels have an essential role in promoting and enabling access to high quality higher education for all members of society. In, in, in consultation with all stakeholder groups, articulate an integrated educational, social and economic agenda to promote equitable access, broadened participation, and success in higher education. Also demonstrate a commitment to equitable access and success by providing adequate funding using models that are sensitive to and appropriate for local conditions and that support higher education institutions and students with financial needs. Create a conducive policy environment that results to increase the public and the private sector funding in support of equitable access of potential and enrolled learners with financial needs. And finally, initiate targeted policies and programs to eliminate academic and other non-financial barriers to access and successful participation in higher education. As I conclude, let me encourage each of you to continue this co conversation with our esteemed panelists as they continue to offer unique perspectives and the insights that will further enrich our understanding and guide our actions moving forward. Together, let us embrace the journey towards a brighter tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening to my inaugural lecture in honor of Professor John Tamburechi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have all listened to Professor Kabudi. He's very eloquent and really invested his time to share. Those who will be here on Saturday will be able to see him in person. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are not on fertile ground in terms of time. and we may need to have some fertilizers really because we are running out of time. Um, there was that uh, quick video. I would like to get it out of the way. Are we ready? Okay. It was one cold morning in June, July of 1981 in Nairobi when a friend, Patrick Kibundu, who was at the Kenya School of Law, walked into my little apartment in the doctor's mess at Kenyatta National Hospital with John. I had never met John before and had no idea why they had come that early. John had arrived that morning from Uganda. Patrick went ahead to introduce us and state why he had brought John to my apartment. John had just escaped from Uganda, fearing for his life under the regime at the time. Some of us attending today will be familiar with this story. Patrick made sure to let me know that we might have different political convictions, but we all cared about our country's destiny and the need for, for, for to be there for each other. We then agreed to share our responsibility for supporting John to settle in. John had been robbed on arrival at the Akamba bus station and he did not have any means of survival. Patrick would provide accommodation and I would provide meals while John found his way. We did not have to do this for long as John quickly found his way around and got a job as a teacher at a private school downtown and found his own accommodation in Italy. 
a one bedroom a one bedroom apartment as that is all he could afford John was in a hurry to get his own place because he had left Pase in Uganda and wanted her to come and join him as quickly as possible. They were expecting a baby and he could not imagine not being there for the birth of their first child. Within about 12 months, John had established himself and moved to slightly bigger accommodation. Being the philanthropist he was and taking his family role seriously, John started bringing over his brothers and family members from Uganda, providing them opportunities that they would not have had, and quickly filling up his new home. At about the same time, I had completed my internship and had to move out of the doctor's mess. John found me a room on the same block where he was living, and I became part of the family. John insisted that I do not cook in my room and that I should have all meals with the family. He also did not expect me to contribute to buy the food in the house. I remember him always going to Marikiti to buy sacks of Irish potatoes and green peas, which were the staple at the house, and maybe what he could afford to feed such a large family. The tables had switched from me providing him with meals to him feeding me. This has always reminded me that you never know what the future holds. That is the John I got to know. For many years, we shared the life of a brother and a friend. We did a lot together and were there for each other. I'll share just two scenarios to show you who John was to me. After Pasa had arrived in Nairobi and they needed to formalize their marriage, John asked me to be his best man and witness to their marriage, which I was honored to do. Later, when I needed to visit my future in-laws for introductions, it was payback time, John became my parent. When my mother was ill and eventually passed away in Nairobi while I was away in the US, John took responsibility until I was able to travel back and ensure that we gave her a deserving funeral back in Uganda. Our greatest bond was based on mutual trust and respect, but most important, in knowing that John would always tell me the truth, even when he knew it would hurt. Many of us will share our experiences with John, but I wanted to share this personal story to show you who John was, even when he did not have much to share. He was always a family man, a philanthropist, and truthful to his friends and four alike. May his soul rest in eternal peace, and may the good Lord enable those of us still here to carry forward his legacy. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Opio Lawyer, Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University here in London, Ontario. I am truly humbled to say a few words at the inaugural uh, Professor John Tamarichi's lecture. Now there is so much to say about my brother John. Of course the word brother is sometimes used loosely as a term of endearment. In my case, I might have come from Gulu and John from Ibanda. But we were truly brothers. I first met John, his wife Pelusi, and two little children, Barbara and Brenda, in the spring of 1985 at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He had completed his Master's of Laws at the University of Nairobi and enrolled at Queen's Law in the PhD program. Now, the very first day we met in their modest little townhouse, John decided we were brothers, and that was that. There was no arguing about it. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing he would hide from me. Issues would be discussed in my presence. He told me without mentioning his words, for example, to settle down and get married. That was John. John had a very sharp mind and very little patience. When he loved you, and he loved a lot of people, he gave you his full attention. He pushed himself to extend research in international law, which he studied in Kenya. 
but he also pushed his wife Pelosi to do a master's in education. The evening at John's apartment were transformed into long strategy sessions. You woman, he would say lovingly to Pelosi, where is your essay? And then he would turn to me, my brother, what about your project? How is it coming along? I credit John for encouraging me to get into graduate school. Well, to be very honest with you, it was more than encouragement. Okay, he just told me flat out, Opio, you need to do your master's now instead of two years later. Uh, when I protested, I protested that I needed money uh, first, he said, what money? I will work hard and I'll give you the money that you need. So the next day I borrowed this old Russian built ladder vehicle and drove two hours away to the University of Ottawa to pick up the application form for the master's program. Uh, in those days, there were no online application. So we spent the next couple of days completing the application and writing all the essays that were needed to go with the application. And so in the summer of 1986, I was accepted in the master's program at the University of Ottawa. Of course, it paved the way later for my PhD. So that was pure John. He believed in education as the equalizer and was relentless in pushing his own family an extended family to get an education, to go higher. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we all gathered here today in uh, memory of uh, my dear friend John. Uh, John and I met at Macquarie University. We were in the same residence, uh, Livingstone Hall, and John was quite impactful in terms of uh, how he interacted with me and any other persons that uh, shared the vision that we did and um, what was most important is the fact that John had the vision of uh, having a united country in the sense that we did not look at uh, uh, people from ethnic point of view, we look at ourselves as Ugandans and that is why our bond became very strong and has remained very strong and that will always be the biggest impact in my life in seeing that uh, although we are from different ethnic group, we share the same views and to me John is a brother to me and will always be a brother to me even in his uh, absence now. But uh, he lives through his uh, wife uh, Pelusi, uh, his uh, three children and he has brought into the world people who will carry his memory and the excellent citizens for the country and for the world and we all uh, pray for his soul to rest in peace. We all miss him and will continue to miss him, but we will carry on with the work that he had started. So I met in Tambiroch actually at Makere University because it was my lecture of international law during my third year at university. Mm. Uh, uh, if I was asked to describe him, I would say that John was John. He was in his own league. He, you couldn't compare him with anyone. First, he was tall, athletic, and handsome. And then 
he was extravagant with his uh, ideas and very articulate in expressing them. So when he was teaching us international law, it is rare to find a person with a command of a subject like him. I've studied in the best universities in the world. Oxford, Yale, Stanford, the London School of Economics, the London School of Oriental African Studies. I've been to Columbia, to Cornell, to whatever university you can choose, Harvard. John is among the best brains I ever came across. So when he came to teach us international law, John always came with a chalk. He never came with the notes at all or anything. And then he would begin discussing international law. You could get a book, you could get anything if you wanted to refer to the case, the headquarters opinion case of the UN or whichever case was before the International Court of Justice. He had command of it in his brain. I've never seen anything like that. I cannot remember any single lecturer in my life who taught me without notes and yet gave the best notes you could read. In fact, my international law notes, which I still have, I have, I have lent them to so many people later who have gone to study international law at different universities. But John dictated those notes without referring to the book. He had mastered the subject after so many years that it just fell out of him. So that is one. Extraordinary brilliance. But you can be brilliant and fail to be a good teacher. John was a very, very good teacher. He, was, he knew how to get ideas out of himself and inculcate them with the students in such an entertaining and intellectually stimulating way that it was so difficult for him to avoid attending his lecture. So I think his lecture was like uh, uh, eating chocolate or playing your most favorite game. Because I remember an incident when we were in the Constituent Assembly, me and my late friend Bob Kasang, attending a debate on multi-party politics. Those were the days when Uganda was basking with this idealism of creating a democracy. So there was a debate, should Uganda have a movement system of government or a multi-party system of government? The multi-partists were some of the best political intellectuals Uganda had. And then there was the Mushegas, the Kategayas, they were on the other side, who were for the movement system, the Amani Mushegas. So, in terms of intellect, the debate was equally balanced. This was uh, what you call a clash between the brain titans. And it was so stimulating and of such national significance, you didn't want to leave. But then we had a lecture with John that same day. So we asked ourselves, we used to leave class at school to go and attend the constituent assembly debates. Me and Bob Kassam had to walk all the way from conference center back to McLean University to attend John's lectures because they had no match in Uganda. There is no intellectual entertainment in Uganda. Maybe the only computer would have been Mohammed Mahmoud lecture. So that is one. But two, he was very, he was not only generous with his ideas, he was generous with his time. Because then we became his friends. I used to visit his home. I would, his kids, like Barbara and Brenda, were little, I would play with them. His wife, I would eat there. So he would not only teach me, but he also parented me, uh, mentored me, and gave me access to himself and his family and his home, and which is very unique. It's rare to find a person like that. I remember one time we attended a, a debate at McKay University, and that's the picture you see, and there was uh, Tajuddin, who was the head of the Pan-African movement. movement. And you know, John was not keen on these things of Pan-Africanism, and he was very critical of socialist ideas, these left-wing ideas. But each time there was a debate between leftists and him on the right, between the command economy and the free market economy, he would speak with flair and uh, confidence. One could even, many people mistook his, uh, his uh, reverence for arrogance because he spoke with such confidence. And sometimes he, with uh, some not so disguised contempt for people who were intellectually weak, <laughs> eh, that. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. And then he knew how to accept the audience. Most people who speak very intelligently don't attract a lot of applause. But John was able to express great ideas with such simplicity, such humor, and such style that he would even move a crowd to understand and cheer what he said. The greatest inter intellectuals, like Daniel Kahneman, for example, he can never appear on TV with his uh, Nobel Prize. He cannot be appear on TV in a debate and be as a command such presence. So John would combine his physical and athletic looks, great intellect, then humor and generosity and such extraordinary confidence. Eh?
My name is Alan Kasucha. I am a senior journalist at the BBC. I am the host of Africa Daily, which is a podcast that deals with African issues. And I am also lead presenter of Newsday, which is the biggest breakfast show in the world. It is an honor to be able to pay tribute to Professor Tabi Rechi. And I want to say thank you very much to the family, to Mrs. Tabi Rechi, to the children, Barbara, Brenda, Brian. Thank you very much for extending me this opportunity. My very first interaction with Professor Tabi Rechi was when I was trying to get into law school. At the time, I didn't do well enough to go in on government scholarship, so I needed to pay my way through um, the course. So a requirement to be an evening student was that you faced a panel of lecturers, professors from the School of Law, and uh, they asked you questions. The questions varied from why you wanted to become a lawyer, whether you had the brains for it, the patience, the focus, and also the financial means to go through the course and interrupt it. And I remember whereas all the other professors, Professor Kakosa, Professor Juko, I think, and others were asking me questions about my capacity uh, to pay for the course and all other questions. Professor Tabi Rechi wanted to know about me. Who am I? What's my philosophy? What are my aspirations? What are my dreams? His presence, his beard, his character, his level of engagement, <laughs> that was memorable. And uh, I met him a few times on campus, he was very gracious, always remembered who I was, remembered my name, kept asking how I was doing. Um, and also, eventually, you know, when I left to go and do other things, um, when I met him, it was a very gracious conversation. I think one of the things that I learned about him, about his greatness, was, not this, was never from him as a person. It was from what other people said of him. And uh, this man, if it was up to him, he would have wanted everybody in Uganda to be a lawyer. He was a teacher, a real teacher who concerned himself not just to the performance of a student, but also beyond that, the welfare of the student. You know, there are so many people who have paid tribute to him since he passed away, and that in itself has been a motivation for me, a personal challenge. You know, when you hear students saying that I'm a lawyer now because Professor Tabirechi took me to law school, and that I come from a family that could never have afforded the school fees, but I was given the opportunity to study by Professor Tabirechi. When you hear people like my friend Andrew Wenda saying that to them he was a parent and a friend and in many ways a confidant. When you hear from women who sell at markets that he used to stop on his way to his home village just so he could buy from them and that might have been the only income they had that day, that he remembered them, that even when he was unwell he still stopped and interacted with them. That for me is inspiring. And that for me is the ultimate definition of impact. How do you live your life? You live your life to impact other people's lives. So if I'm gracious, if I extend anything, any courtesy to anybody, especially people who are much younger than me, it's because of people like Professor Tony Rich, people who see you, who hear you, who see your dreams and who help you achieve those dreams. <sighs> his name will live on for a very long time. There will be people who will testify of his greatness for a very, very long time. I honor him so much and I pray that he continues to rest in peace. But I also honor his family. I thank you again. You know, I honor Mrs. Tamirechi. She's a fighter, a soldier. She epitomizes commitment. 
And there are lessons to be learned from that as well. And also the children that they have raised. Barbara, Brenda, Brian. May God bless you. May God give you the fortitude you need to continue with life after the passing of your great, great father. May God bless you all. My name is Dr. Monica Magoke Mhoja from Tanzania. I met the late Professor John when I joined the board of Accorde. He was such a joyful man, loving, kind, and the things which are very memorable to me is when he really tried to speak with me in Kiswahili. Haberia Tanzania, Hawajambo Tanzania, and he would be laughing and giving me stories about Tanzania. Wow! And you know, smiling, laughing is good for our health. And the very important thing which has reminded with me is his good leadership skills especially when he was giving guidance you know a chairing the board of according he was such a man with wisdom solving some of the problems very very simply a loving father as well so god bless you love to the family he has really lived a great mark in my heart and I've learned leadership skills from him. God bless you all. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Josephine Odera and uh, I worked with uh, John Tambiriche both at the University of Nairobi and also at Accord, Uganda. I first met John at the University of Nairobi around 1989. I just joined the teaching staff and here comes this big burly professor and he addresses me as Josephine. I see you have joined the staff. And we had a good laugh around that I could see that he was uh, experienced already and over time we got to talk and do seminars together, present papers at similar events and then finally we met at Accord where he was the chair and I became his deputy. What I found really interesting about John was uh, his knowledge of African history and also how he um, interacted with people, big, both big and small. I was particularly touched by how he was involved in Uganda's liberation movement, second liberation, I would say, and how he was so closely associated with many other struggles in Africa and his close knowledge of what was happening in those countries. Of course, his knowledge on the environment was something else, and environmental law in particular. Um, John was this sort of person who could make you feel big, even though you were small. I uh, could uh, make you feel very confident about what you're doing. John never set out to make people feel inadequate. 
he always brought out the positive in people and tried to help as many people as possible. And above all, he was a very jolly person, a boisterous in nature, and uh, a person that you could easily speak to about different things in life. Um, I've taken up over now as the chair of Accord and trying to walk in uh, John's footsteps. Still feeling somehow inadequate because John could reach so, so many people and uh, was always so very helpful. So we miss him, but we appreciate all that he did. Hi, dear friends. I just like to say that I'm very honored to have been given the opportunity to say a few words in honor of my friend and colleague, uh, Professor John Ntabireki. I met John as a young lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He was much older, but I had just joined in 1990 and uh, he had the office next to mine and so that meant that if I had anything that I needed to ask I stepped into his office. I developed a close friendship with him and uh, it is not surprising that when he went to work for the UN environment I went uh, and did a consultancy there and worked with him. I would also say that uh, in later years, John and I met as academics of law and we shared times without number, how we wanted the legal uh, landscape to be. John was an idealist and he was a person who wanted to see uh, good ideas come to fruition. I was not surprised when he left Makerere and uh, went and founded the law school at Grotius. And uh, I interacted with him as a board member of uh, the Ad Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment. He was the chair. And each time that John and I met, we reminisced about our old days at the University of Nairobi, but we also shared how we wanted to see the law uh, landscape develop. I had uh, occasion to be the chair of the Kenya School of Law, and I met students that had come from Grotius Law School, and many of them were really grounded, and I did give this feedback to John. Uh, John was really a fine mind. Not long ago, I met a colleague, Professor Kelly. Professor Ke Patrick Kelly uh, is an emeritus professor at Widener University. Widener had a program that they brought to the University of Nairobi every summer. And uh, we, we taught the students in Nairobi. They visited UNEP, but... Uh, that stopped uh, just before COVID. I met Kelly not too long ago. We had dinner. He had visited uh, Kenya with his wife and uh, he asked me, where is John? And he was really shocked when I told him that John was no longer with us. And he said, and I quote, he was one of the finest minds that I had interacted with. That was John. I, I would say that uh, we lost uh, a gallant soldier. Uh, there were many people working on environment. Uh, Professor John Okidi, Charles Okidi rather, is uh, famed as uh, the father of environmental law. And if he was the father of environmental law, because I believe he was older than John, then maybe John was either the younger father or he was an, a grand uncle of environmental law. I would just like to tell the family, Mrs. Ntabireki, we met um, uh, when you just uh, retired from uh, UNICEF when uh, I came 
to see John when he wasn't feeling well and he was in hospital. And we knew you when you were in Nairobi. I would like to say that we lost a good friend and uh, I do look forward uh, when I am done with my tour of duty as an international civil servant to getting back into the academy. And uh, I can assure you that uh, the university that you are now chancellor of will be one of the spaces that I will make a pit stop at. Barbara, uh, continue to work on uh, biotechnology you are stepping into the grand shoes of your daddy and we are here to spur you along thank you and uh, wish you all happy memories and uh, remembrances of our friend and gallant soldier gone to be with the lord I came to know the late Professor John Nabrechi in the early 90s, but started interacting with him in the year 2002 when he became my lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Makerere University. Professor John Nabrechi was very passionate about knowledge generation and dissemination, and beyond lecturing, he carried out research and informed a number of laws uh, in this country. John Nabrechi influenced my career as a researcher, policy analyst, and environmental rights advocate. Minister for Local Government and Member of Parliament of Nyangabo County and the citizen of Toro. Distinguished guests in your various capacities, Bishop Ruenzori Diocese, members of academic and administrative staff of this university in your various ranks, members of the academic community from other universities, the clergy, representatives of local governments, graduates, students of this university, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great pleasure to be here for the seventh occasion to welcome you to the Uganda Pentecostal University to attend this congregation and witness the graduations of these young citizens of East Africa in the various ranks as will be demonstrated the graduation ceremonies. I would now like to thank my friends, the graduates, who today will go through the transition from pupil to master. You came to us to study, and we have attempted to make you the best we could. We shall be happy with the persons we have instructed. An old theologian, Thomas Kempis, who lived between 1380 and 1471 AD, observed in his book, The Imitation of Christ, in chapter 16, that be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. We, the university, are happy to have done our job, and now release you to the bigger teacher, which is the world. In that bigger world, please hear and follow the teachings of those great men of learning, whom we have exposed you and remember to continue reading ladies and gentlemen go into the world with modesty recognize your limits and your extent then you will be sure to go forward
Eh? Eh? You have some hunkies? A wonderful club. Really. In honor of Professor Johnny Tambirechi, I am going to request us to stand up for a moment of silence to thank God who gave us Professor Tambirechi and that his mission, his dream, the work of his hands will live beyond those who are here. May his soul continue to rest in a perfect uh, peace. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to welcome you back from that very captivating moment. I notice you are all feeling uh, excited, deflated, all in different capacities and measure. But that is it that brought us here. So the organizers prepared this for you, and I think it is rich. We all have gotten a glimpse of uh, this Colossus, the trailblazer, the, 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 the man himself. It is true, he was large, and he was everlasting in terms of whatever he touched. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ntambirechi. As you hear us while walking around, please know we are here saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am officially in trouble. I am entangled. And I don't think I can be disentangled from the entanglement that I have found myself entangled in. <laughs> we have the panel discussions, but after them we will have a, a health break, something to eat, bite, and drink. But um, I am of the view... that you allow me have my way of uh, putting this panel discussion, we are going to change the mode. And I request, instead of direct presentations, I will ask a few questions. Uh, the presenters clarify on them, and then we can really bring this thing into, uh, into something, the way we came here and what we came for. Um, I request for your indulgence, and I would uh, seek for permission to do that. Um, Madam Chancellor, I seek your full indulgence to allow me, but also I need guidance given the time to the presenters. I know you have done a lot of work, but I need you to agree with me that we are finished. We are caught up. Madam VC, I don't know if there is consensus by way of uh, putting up arms that uh, we do this quickly so that it is not in between the, the food we are supposed to eat. Is that okay? You second? Okay. Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I now kindly request our panelists um, to to come up to the uh, podium, to the stage. I'm um, uh, Dr. Eric Jita, the Principal Education Officer at the uh, Ministry of Education. To come and speak to us about government policies and initiatives, please come and take your seat. Um, I now also request uh, um, um, Dr. Michael Atim, lecturer, Faculty of Science and uh, Technology, MAST. Uh, you are going to speak about identifying opportunities for increased access to higher education. 
I also, in the same vein, request uh, uh, Mrs. Elizabeth uh, Ruamwenge, who is going to speak about promoting gender equality and inclusivity in uh, education, in higher education, from Mountains of the Moon University. And I now call upon Dr. Aitha uh, Beinom Jisha uh, to speak about role of civil society and private uh, sector from Accord. I am going to bring you the microphones. Yes, yes. Um, allow me make a special mention, ladies and gentlemen. With us in the audience is a guest who traveled from Kampala to represent the Uganda Revenue Authority. Um, uh, uh, Nasanga uh, Allen is uh, Assistant Commissioner, Research and Innovation. We really want to thank you uh, for coming to grace uh, this uh, ceremony. We know that we have had issues with the uh, URA a lot of discussion has been spoken and the title of your office you know assistant commissioner research and innovation information technology and information department really this is a very academic uh, department with lots of uh, practical work and maybe upu should uh, have a, a department on uh, tax research and innovation so that it can train the local people on how to fill their tax returns, probably create an internet hub here where everyone in Fort Porto can find people at UPU. And you are guided on how to give uh, your money back to government. So I think we should, since this is innovation and research, we request, I think we have a room that we can give you a uh, to give us some computers and we put an internet cafe to support a, uh, yes, tax. We request that you take the message back to the Commissioner General. We requested him to come and he dutifully asked you to represent him. Tell him we really love him, we see him, we wouldn't want to be near him, but you know, he's also very crucial. He's also very, very crucial. Without him, a lot of services we look for, including the access to education we are speaking about here today, the role of government is very key. UPU trains government children. So it is real, everyone is, uh, is for the government. So we really want to thank URA, send back our love and regard, and say Professor Ntambirechi would have also been happy to see you today. Thank you very, very much, and very safe journey when you return to the city of Kampala. And don't forget to tell people that uh, the Fort Porto Tourism City you know, invites everyone, tell colleagues when you have a break, holiday, eh, uh, MP Alex would uh, help in uh, ensuring you enjoy your stay in Fort Porto. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, Riare, I would request that uh, we all know our topics to start with Mr. Jita. Um, a quick introduction of yourself and the topic so that uh, we all run through. As uh, panelists, we really welcome you. Thank you for all the preparation. And uh, I would ask um, uh, Mr. Jita, you know, the government policies and initiatives. Give us a uh, an introduction and quick uh, background some of these uh, policies in uh, about two or three minutes. Okay, you, thank you so much. Switch, switch uh, on the microphone, everyone. Okay. The moderator. 
and the members in the house uh, all protocol observed good afternoon ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the ministry of education and sports i bring you greetings from our minister of education and sports the state ministers the permanent secretary the directors and commissioners plus other staff at the ministry of education um eric jita i work as a principal education officer in the department that is responsible for university education and training at the ministry of education and sports and my role here is basically to give a discussion on the government policies and initiatives for enhancing access to higher education. At this point, when we are honoring the late Professor John Tambirochi, you allow me to give you a snapshot on the history and development of education policies in Uganda. Echoing from the earlier presenters and how Professor John Tambirochi committed himself to the development of education in this country way back in 1925 at the time when we had the first African teachers as pioneers of education who came in and started the development of private investment of education in Uganda. That was uh, Robin Mukasa Sebanja, who started the first private school in Uganda at Degea near Bombo in the rural district. Later on, others came and joined him and started Chuak Tu Memorial College at Namungona in 1927, and then uh, Agri Memorial College in 1930, that was at Bunamaya, Old Kampala and Tebe Road, that town of Bunamaya, where the sisters of the late Dr. Karinachi Ernest also came in and started Agri Memorial Primary School in 1942. And from there, we started seeing other developments to the foundation of Light College Katikamu near Masurita in 1948. These African pioneers started private schools after realizing that the missionaries at that time and the colonial government had undivided interests in promoting education, leaving out several vulnerable Ugandans who would have got an opportunity also to study. But because they were denied an opportunity to join the missionary schools and the colonial government schools, these African pioneers came together and had the idea of starting private schools with an interest of doing a service doing something that was similar to the interests of the missionaries and the colonial government. So in 1953, the colonial government, after realizing that private schools have started mushrooming under the government of Sir Andrew Cohen, they set up what was called the Debansen's Education Committee. And within the Education Committee, the Debansen's Education Committee, they developed a small committee that was headed by Mr. Cheswas to look at the development of private schools and to guide them to move in line with the interests of the missionary schools and the colonial government schools. From that time, that is when now the development of education policies started coming up. And the first education policy, after we got independence, 
was the Education Act, which was developed in 1970, with an interest of ensuring access, quality, and equity of education of all persons in Uganda. It is from that Education Act of 1970 that other education policies have been coming up. In addition, with the inspection reports that have been developed by the different organs of the Ministry of Education and Sports. Today, we are seeing so many policies coming up. And these policies are aimed at advising, guiding, coordinating, regulating the interests of private investors to move in line with the interests of the government of Uganda in fulfilling the education of every Ugandan through Article 30 of the Constitution of Uganda. Briefly, that is what I can give you to the development of policies, of education policies in Uganda. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jita. Thank you very, very much. And I think UPU fits that criteria despite the different times. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jita. Uh, Dr. Tim, tell us, what are these uh, current barriers preventing, you know, certain populations? Or paint for us a picture of Uganda today in terms of uh, opportunities that uh, people would uh, take advantage of to access higher education. Uh, slide number six. Okay, thank you very much, the MC. Um, in the interest of time, let me also write on the protocol, which have already been yes. established. Yes. Yeah, um, my name is uh, Michael Robson, a team from Barara University. I teach physics in the Faculty of Science and also where there's a crisis across the Faculty of Medicine to teach radiological physics. MRI, CT scan, and so on, nuclear medicine. Um, I, if you could allow me to stand. Yes, please. Yeah, um, before I talk about the opportunities. Just don't fall down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> before I talk about the opportunities, um, let me first give you some figures so that we know where the real problem is. Because um, we have people here who can um, take this to the next level. Um, I looked at some data from around 2015, actually from 2007 up to date, and then I just took the average. Um, there are other slides that uh, speak about the same, but I just particularly chose this one because this one will give us the light. And actually the problem that we want to solve in as far as access to our education lies on this slide. Um, if I can tell you, uh, we have pre-primary school, that is nursery and so on. We normally have about, um, about uh, 500 to 600 uh, pupils. But um, in each class, you have about 120, 180. But um, looking at the data, you find um, the middle class, the pupils are always lower compared to the, the baby and then the top. Because, you know, parents like jumping here and there. I know these kids grow quickly. Um, so you would expect P1, if they are to transit from top, which is about um, 180 in number, you would expect P1 to be about also around 180 or 200. But here, we have about 2 million. 2 million people enrolled in P1 on average, for, according to the data. Now, by the time they're sitting PLE, they are in 720. Now, in between, we have lost about 1.3, 1.4 pupils. And um, first of all, now, where do they go? Um, now, just like you saw the previous um, results, which were released about two weeks ago, there were about 749 there. But in that class, they were 1.8 when they were, when they enrolled for P1. But you can see, but this is just the average. Now, by the time they're sitting for S4, that is UCE, 
again we will have lost about 391 students okay now this 391 by the time they are now sitting for senior six they are just in um 99,000 and um, those who can access from this 99 with because we know university if you are to join university you must have two principal passes all right but now you find out of those it's only about 67,000 with two principal passes and this one 31,280 with less than two principal passes, meaning they cannot join university. And now that's where we are. When you talk about access to higher education and um, the opportunities which are there, we are just simply looking at this number. Okay? But of course, you should know we have lost a lot of human resource right from P1. By the time we are reaching here, um, we only have about 67 which are useful from 2 million, okay? And of course we know um, the role of higher education. <coughs> now, what opportunities do we have for this number? Remember the other ones, uh, we don't have opportunities for them. We are not talking about that now, but we are not talking about this. How can we make them access education? Now, I think maybe I can now sit. Oh, sorry. Um, now, there is a program uh, which is called Higher Education Access Certificate Program. This program, a team of um, academicians from Barara University, where I happen to be one of them, Gulu University and uh, Busitama University, sat down, we were seven in number, and then um, we developed a one-year program where if you fail to get two principal passes but you have only one O, it means you can be taught because um, if you go to different parts of the country you find these students um, they study under different conditions others are so alarming okay and um, also with our education system where you have to sit for one examination that is um, UNEP, and you are, there are schools where even students that have never done practicals, they have never seen even the examiners. You see, most of these schools, you find them in Wakiso and, and so on and so forth. If you go to places like Kapilibion, Kanungu, and so on, very hard to reach places. You may find passing exams there, it's very difficult. And yet, these students are not dull. They are not dull. But it's only the environment which affected them to make them perform that way. So this program, if you come for it, it is a one-year program. And um, you, after passing, then you can join a program of your dream. But of course, you have to pass with the, you know, there are classes, class one, two, and three. So those who pass with distinction, they always go for good, um, good um, courses. Now, this program is already running at Mbarara University, Busitema, and Gulu. Now, um, even some other universities now that are coming up. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to conclude with it, UPU, how now UPU comes in. Now, for, for Busitema, they started running this program in 2009, because this program, after developing it, the National Council of Higher Education gazetted it as the fourth route into the university, and then this gives now opportunity for the 39 students, 39,000 students I was talking about. Because now there, are, there is a direct route where you come direct from senior six. There is a um, diploma entry and mature. So those were three routes that we knew. But now there is this fourth route, which is called the Higher Education Access Certificate Program, abbreviated as HEC. So now um, we also had... Um, uh, an engagement with the professional bodies, the, 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 the law society, the allied health, and so on. So uh, we had an engagement with them, and then they understood what actually we are talking about, because after completing these students, they, 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 need, they need to register. 
with those bodies and they, those bodies need to be recognized. So, um, there are students now who are in their third year after passing through this program and they're doing quite well. And now we are conducting a study on comparing them with those who go direct and then these ones. And preliminary research, preliminary data is telling us that they do very well and they're so um, determined to do this program and um, they're really comparing favorably and very well. So um, we have gone to a number of universities. Last week we were here at UPU. We had a three-day workshop with the members of staff here to develop and customize HEC for UPU. And um, any, any, any time from now, uh, we are expecting, because we, we want the feedback, we are expecting them to give us the, the, the first the, the draft. We looked through it, we edited it, and um, by the next intake, I'm very sure UPU will have been accredited by the National Council. And in the next intake, they will offer this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atim. Thank you very, very much. That is quite uh, educative. I'm uh, going on to uh, uh, promoting gender and e gender e equality and inclusivity. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ramwenje, what is this all about? Teach us. Conscript us into the rightful thinking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I've been introduced. Except I want to correct something small. I don't work with Mountains of the Moon University except I was introduced by someone from there. I'm a senior educationist. I've been serving for several years under teacher education, and I've served as an administrator in various institutions for some good time, and uh, I retired of recent. I'm here to talk about gender equality and inclusivity in our institutions. It's very, very important. When we talk about gender, some people think we are going to just look at the girl, child, or the female side of it. No. We are here, our mission is to advocate for gender equality, to foster an environment where every student, regardless of gender, can thrive and contribute to the progress of our society in Uganda and in the whole world. We are all aware that if you miss out one of the six, then you are, you are missing it out completely. We have seen the country has tried to bring on board or to fight for the girl child for some good time, but we are seeing imbalance still. Why? Because now the male side of it is not um, helped. Some of them have started actually uh, in performance, their performance is dwindling slowly. You heard of the results that we got from PLA and the O level. Females are excelling what is happening. So this is why we are calling upon everyone to think about uh, gender equality. As much as Uganda, as the country has brought on board various change agents and some positive change has been observed, but there is still a gap which all of us here should mind about. We need to address gender disparities in education. To achieve, to achieve this, we must actively work towards dismantling barriers that hinder the academic and personal growth of both male and female students. 
let's acknowledge the importance of inclusive curriculum design in our institutions. The curriculum design is very, very important. That is something that we should all think about. When you are designing your curriculum for your institution, is it gender sensitive? That's important. The people who are procuring materials for learning, do they mind about what is in those materials? Are they gender sensitive? That's important also. The stories that are there and all that, is it gender sensitive? Additionally, we should also provide equal opportunities for leadership and participation in our institutions. Let it be balanced. Why do we go for only every year, only one gender coming up in leadership? Why don't we consciously think about balancing in one way or the other? So it is us to move that. Let's encourage girls also to pursue subjects to do with science, technology, mathematics, and engineering in our institutions. You know, it comes from our culture, the cultural norms, the way parents handle these children. They tell them a girl child cannot manage a science subject, can't manage mathematics, can't manage engineering. But we have seen good engineers who are ladies what does that mean that the trend has changed? That we should also try to help our girls to love taking engineering, mathematics, and all those science subjects. And the reverse is also true. Let us also encourage the boys to feel comfortable in engaging in artistic and humanitarian activities. When I was teaching, I used to see my, my students, when they would go for school practice, they would, they would love to go, uh, all boys would love to go in upper primary classes, upper primary classes. I discouraged them, I said, can you try? Because if you try lower, you'll get distinctions out of it. And the boys tried lower, they got distinctions, so everyone started now teaching in lower. And you would see how small children love male teachers in the lower classes. So, encourage them, break down that barrier. That mentality. That the, the boys have to teach only upper, that the boys are the ones who take mathematics, that they are the ones who take science subjects. Let us encourage the girls also to do that. The teacher training is also another key factor or element in creating inclusivity. Provide inclusion in a classroom to support all students' learning. If a teacher or a lecturer has that sense of gender equality, then the learners or the, the students will learn from him and when he, they, they move out, the, the students will always have the gender sensitivity in them. Without it, if a lecturer uses an example of minimizing a, a female student in a class, they all laugh and clap. But remember, you are intimidating someone, you are intimidating the, the girl child. And the reverse is also the other one. Where you use the boys, boys are only drunkards. That one will also intimidate the boy. So we need to be gender sensitive and we need to train our lecturers, instructors to always be gender sensitive. They should also equip their learners with tools to recognize and address 
unconscious biases. These are significantly, um, they impact the way they interact with students. They foster an environment of respect and equal treatment. Let us try to do that in our classrooms, in our lecture rooms. Remember, gender inequality affects everyone. So not only one part, it affects all of us. Those are the things that have even brought domestic violence these days in our homes. Because they got their bias either from, from school or from such a university. Through the lectures they attend, through the way they are handled by lecturers. So when they, are, they, they get their homes, they go and apply it. So we have domestic violence every now and again. Um, when we have the gender equality, it is very safe and healthier. Gender equality helps prevent violence and is good for our economy. Let us try to support networks within educational institutions that can help to address challenges faced by both genders, creating forums for open dialogue, mentorship programs, and peer support initiatives. This can contribute to a more inclusive and supportive educational communities. In conclusion, achieving gender equality and inclusivity in Uganda, educational institutions requires us to put in effort through embracing an inclusive class, classroom, sorry, curriculum design, providing equal opportunities for all, offering teacher training and fostering support networks. With all these, we can create an environment where every student has a chance to reach their full potential. I beg to move. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for all those uh, statements on gender inclusivity and particularly pointing out that uh, the young boys must also all men should not be uh, left out since education is uh, lifelong we we don't stop we want to see also men coming back for higher education uh, so ladies and gentlemen um, uh, with dr arthur we will after he has spoken, we are going to have a, a health break. We will have a meal. The student population will be served from where you are. And then uh, the elders will uh, go and sit behind uh, Professor Antambirechi and uh, have a quick bite for at least 10 minutes so that we come back and then we launch the foundation, get a vote of thanks and we pray for journey masses. Um, uh, Dr. Benom Jisha, uh, promote, I mean, role of a uh, civil society and private uh, sector. How can the private sector investments be leveraged to provide the uh, scholarships or financial aid for marginalized students? And is there a role or has civil society been involved in uh, this equation of uh, education and uh, uh, access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, I've already been introduced, uh, but for emphasis, Dr. Vinom Sha, um, Executive Director Court and an academic. I've taught uh, at Makere University for 15 years, and now I teach at U, uh, Uganda Christian University, and I <coughs> am a vice chair of the board here. So I'm an educationist, but I'm also in civil society. Uh, but I also own a private school <coughs> the, uh, for purposes of business. Uh, a young uh, primary school is in uh, Kampala, for some of you who come from uh, Chira, uh, Buwate, it's called Cornerstone. It's a Christian uh, community school. So I'm an entrepreneur, but we emphasize Christian values and STEM, science, technology, and mathematics. 
So uh, I think the subject that I am faced with is very dear to me. <clears throat> there is a role uh, uh, of uh, civil society and private sector in enhance in uh, access of education, inclusivity, and actually quality of education in this country. And actually, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> uh, to date, the especially private uh, uh, private schools, uh, right from uh, primary up to, to universities, have more uh, more uh, students and pupils, and uh, and of course, grad uh, yeah, students. And uh, uh, the essentially, uh, the private sector, you know, is there for profit. It is driven by profit. Uh, want to maximize as much profit as possible in the private sector. But while they are driven by the profit, they have to compete and therefore offer and deliver quality education. Uh, and that's why, of course, it's important for government to come in sometimes to regulate uh, the private sector and the civil society. Uh, just uh, on the civil society, uh, uh, speaking from a court, a court's perspective, our impact on, on the education sector in this country, I think we, we have partnerships where uh, I know that we have actually triggered uh, the teaching of peace and human rights in this country. And, uh, uh, and so you can see, our court has a partnership. Had a partnership, it ended with Makere University, Barra University of Science and Technology, Guru University, Kampara University of Professor Katerega, to introduce the teaching of peace and conflict studies and human rights in this country. We brought in money and experts and developed the curriculum and now uh, the teaching of peace studies in this country is settled, and that actually was spearheaded by a court. Uh, so if you hear, and I followed and the thought uh, that uh, designed the curriculum, uh, which is taught across the country, that's a contribution. Our partnership with the uh, UPU here is evident. We have donated books uh, uh, to, the, to the university here, we have provided some uh, uh, money. We have also given lectures, uh, guest lectures, that man, Onesimus, myself, and Goldman, others have actually given lectures uh, to this university. I have taught at, Makir, at Imbarara University of Science and Technology as a visiting lecturer, starting the teaching of peace and conflict studies, which uh, I think they reduced it now to a module. So if you are doing development, I think it's even mainstream. He will confirm. Everyone is doing, Everyone is doing it. I'm the pioneer. <laughs> Many years uh, uh, in Imbarara, I actually I became expensive for them and they let me go, but we had already uh, developed the curriculum. <laughs> yes, I would come and they put me in a hotel. It was expensive to teach, but I have, I have people who have graduated whom I taught to be studies, and they are out there. Uh, so the civil society also organizations have schools, uh, others I think have universities. Because when we talk about civil society, it's a big, I didn't, uh, I didn't actually uh, conceptualize what civil society is. These are autonomous in, uh, institutions that exist between the state and the society and existing to amplify the voice or the rights uh, of the voiceless. And they, 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 check, the, they, they check the state. And these include faith-based organizations, uh, professional bodies, like the General Association, the law, the law uh, uh, FIDA, they include the, <coughs> like these, the casitas. They are, they are very, very important. And most of these have schools. And they are, have universities now. They are making a big contribution, especially bringing access to the disadvantaged so, uh, members of our society. If they were not there, they will not. You see, the government has a mandate to provide uh, education to everyone, but it is limited. Uh, it has a limited capacity, and therefore, civil society uh, reaches out. You can imagine like, education in Karamoja. You know, civil society would be there. This could be missionaries, could be uh, because they are part of the body of civil society. Private sector, uh, uh, which this university is part, have played a very big role through, and you know, can't say much about the contribution of Professor Tamirich, making these people who would not actually have afforded to get university education, but also the pathways, certificate, they enter certificate, they move on, 
get diplomas and get degrees. That pathway that he's talking about, private universities have done that because they're interested in profit. They're always driven by profit, but they actually contribute uh, to, to, to the development of this country. So remove them and the education sector of Uganda would collapse. So for me, uh, uh, in the final analysis, I think what we need to do, because uh, government has to regulate, because it has the mandate as government to regulate the private sector and the, the, and, and, and the civil society. Because private sector, uh, the profit, the greed, can actually lead them to do wrong things. Like now my brother from the ministry, I think it's, it is the policy of this government to emphasize science and technology, and that's the root for, for, for education to transform this country. You see, uh, uh, and of course, the, the chancellor is here, and the vice chancellor is here, and the chairman council. I think we need to move and transform this university into science, the university of science and technology. Science is, this is a government policy, because that's the way to go. That's the way to transform and develop Africa. You know, uh, I, and I have not had a chance to meet the, the education, the committee. Why should we take, why should it take 24 or 22 years for a person to finish and start working? Do you know that in these homes we have 22 years old, 24 years old, they are waiting to graduate from universities to become producers of wealth? Because that's the education system. When you compare our education system with like China, where children of 10 years have started producing products that they export to Africa. So I think it is important, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, so I support the government uh, policy on science. They may have done it badly, but this is the way to go. But even now, uh, I think uh, Chancellor, trans transforming this university into al aligning it with the government policy, but also an African vision. Because Africa is a net importer. We need to export, and I agree with the with our member of parliament uh, uh, when he talks about decolonizing the mind. Because the, court of the type of education that the colonists gave us is to produce white collar job people. The tie you see here is a Mzungu. And if I'm not in a tie, I feel less. So I need to put on a tie in the place. But also we stay longer at school without producing wealth. So that is imp it's important to transform all these institutions, even from Nasaret to begin, to especially STEM. I, I, I've been introduced to STEM. I don't understand it a lot. I'm educating myself. We need to emphasize that at all levels so that Africa can be a net export, exporter than an, an, than an importer. I think I'll, I'll stop at that if there are questions I'll take it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very, very much. I would ask each one of you to have a closing the closing uh, minute uh, from us uh, as a code, a code is a partner, and we have an MOU with the Uganda Pentecostal University that commits us. You want to applaud that? Because hey. we bring in a, a, a code, uh, uh, we have high talent. We know we attracted the top talent uh, with concentration of material, uh, uh, intellectual material, we think. And, uh, and our job is also to trigger innovation to to say the inconvenient truth so that we can hurt ourselves and develop. Because we've been scattering around the mountain for a long, long time. So uh, from that, so we have actually MOUs. We have an MOU with, we have also an MOU with Uganda Christian University where, uh, uh, where I also teach. And uh, so what I can commit uh, is that actually we are going to trigger you. We are going to, to, uh, to tell you the inconvenient truth so that this university can be known for promoting science and technology. And we promise to donate books that we uh, that actually have high quality. Uh, uh, we'll, continue, uh, uh, we'll continue, if we can do joint fundraising, uh, writing joint proposals with you, then we can even uh, afford to give some scholarships to the disadvantaged. Because what uh, Professor Antamuich used to do, he gave me two scholarships. The, the tuition was one, was one million. I paid 500. Throughout I have a lawyer uh, who finished here. She's an accomplished lawyer, an attorney. Uh, also, someone did BBA here. We are paying 500, 500. But you know, uh, uh, the university lost that. So if we wrote good uh, proposals and approached foundations, it's possible that that, that you always, for our goal, would come in the university. So we do joint proposals, 
joint research, joint publications with you to raise the quality of this university to world class. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, on gender equality and inclusivity, I think we need to think about handling it in our day-to-day -day activities as, as an institution. Let it be with everyone who handles a student. Let's be role models to them. And uh, in, in, in our curriculum design, in, in whatever we do, in what, whichever activity we do in an institution, let us think about gender equality and inclusivity. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, what I can say about um, the, these enhanced opportunities, uh, it's um, that this program, HEC, if you do it, say, like from uh, Uganda Pentecostal University, after successfully completing it, then you can join any other university. It's almost just like UNEP, but you are, you are assessed by the same person who taught you. And um, what, uh, because the, the ministry is here, and I have a Pan-Africanist also a us, the Honorable Member, um, some of these disparities are induced disparities in our education system. For example, you may have a very intelligent child, because we normally advocate for equal rights for every child. You may have an intelligent child, maybe with aggregate five, but from maybe a peasant background. But this, this child, the brain is so good that it's supposed to as access these first class schools. But you find, you find this first class school saying, uh, we have stopped at five, you have stopped at four, you are sold somewhere. But if you go to such schools later on, you find there are those with under seven, eight, nine, even ten. And you would imagine if they can get such grades of fours, then why is it that even at, the, at all levels they produce second grade? So some of these disparities are induced, which I think can be solved at maybe some level, maybe policy level, and so on, because there's no problem without a solution. Because we are losing very intelligent brains just because of that, because of induced disparities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the government policies and initiatives for enhancing access to higher education are quite many. And uh, we always look at the government white paper that was developed in 1992 as the motherboard of these initiatives. That is why you've seen the curriculum of our education system being revised to make it competence-based, to make it science-based. In fact, we have some policies uh, under the Students' Higher Education Financing Policy. Sometimes people call it the Students' Loan Scheme, giving an opportunity to every Ugandan. In the line of science, innovation, and technology to apply for government support. So whenever you hear a call for that, you should get attracted to apply. Then we have the, the higher education policy that we are still developing, and the interest is to ensure increased access to higher education that is competent to transform this country. And at that level, we are working with several stakeholders. In fact, I'm happy that today I'm meeting ACCORD and it has been meet, uh, missing on our team. It will be an opportunity for ACCORD to join the Higher Education Technical Working Group to have these ideas being put together to say that at least we have higher education that is ready to transform this nation. Of course, the list is endless. 
of the government policies. And if there is an opportunity for these presentations to be shared to the members who are here, I think it will add value for them to get to learn more of what is existing on the side of Ministry of Education and Sports on the side of my other colleagues here, such that we can move together, we can put our brains together and have a better education system that is not only looked at as government, but also as private. As Minister of Education, we highly recognize and appreciate the contribution of the private investors in the education system of Uganda. At one time, we asked ourselves, if they are not in government, if they are not in private institutions, where will the students and staff be? So that question, when we continue to think about it, we continue to appreciate and recognize private investment in education, including Uganda Pentecostal University. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, really, the last one among many. When I played yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I spoke uh, privately with the Prime Minister, uh, uh, and I, I recalling the, the what the Honorable Runda was talking about. Are you qualified to share the private? No, listen, I'm, 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 just, I'm just going to yes, put it. Yeah, actually, we are discussing about you know, attracting foreign direct investment. UPU is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, it's not a foreign direct investment, but it's an investment within Toro Kingdom. And I was uh, talking about, and actually, I borrowed the relief of Buganda Kingdom. Buganda attracted and gave free land to institutions, and actually, that's why now most of the best performing schools are in Wakiso, they are in Mkono and they are in Entebbe and in PG. And so uh, I was wondering whether they, they actually they could consider to donate that three to four acres of land to UPU and actually give them a title because the investment in this in Toro is enormous and uh, actually they would reap. And uh, I, 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 he took notes. Uh, I just, I, I saw him took notes, but also, uh, 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 Honorable Runda talked about that. You know, they, they, and actually you could guide us. The National Council of Science and Technology, the National Council for Higher Education, requires three acres, isn't it, for the university? So I was, uh, I thought that uh, uh, this also, as we commemorate, as we remember this great giant who brought an investment in this, in this kingdom, that the kingdom would reciprocate. Of course, they have already done a lot by having a permanent relationship of land and it, uh, it will go in the annals of history of this kingdom. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. I am kindly requesting that uh, we take a health break. The students and the rest of the community, let us feel free to stay there. I'm going to request the vice chancellor to lead the uh, uh, the guests at the table there. We will have, where is the usher? We will have something to eat. Now, this is the catch. We have to launch the John Intambirechi Foundation. But it is not fair to launch it when we are not seeing. When we are <laughs> not smiling. So, let us have 10 minutes of a health break. Get something to eat. We can make it a uh, working lunch or working snack. We return here for 20 minutes and we launch the John Ntambirechi Foundation. I beseech each one of you to take it as a noble duty to stand with this giant in absentia that we will see a foundation in his honor launched and commissioned today. Do we all say yes, we shall return?
It was one cold morning in June, July of 1981 in Nairobi when a friend, Patrick Kigundu, who was at the Kenya School of Law, walked into my little apartment in the doctor's mess at Kenyatta National Hospital with John. I had never met John before and had no idea why they had come that early. John had arrived that morning from Uganda. Patrick went ahead to introduce us and state why he had brought John to my apartment. John had just escaped from Uganda, fearing for his life under the regime at the time. Some of us attending today will be familiar with this story. Patrick made sure to let me know that we might have different political convictions, but we all cared about our country's destiny and the need for, for, for to be there for each other. We then agreed to share our responsibility for supporting John to settle in. John had been robbed on arrival at the Akamba bus station and he did not have any means of survival. Patrick would provide accommodation and I would provide meals where John found his way. We did not have to do this for a long as John quickly found his way around and got a job as a teacher at a private school downtown and found his own accommodation in his city. A one bedroom a one bedroom apartment as that is all he could afford. John was in a hurry to get his own place because he had left Pase in Uganda and wanted her to come and join him as quickly as possible. They were expecting a baby and he could not imagine not being there for the birth of their first child. Within about 12 months, John had established himself and moved to slightly bigger accommodation. Being the philanthropist he was and taking his family role seriously, John started bringing over his brothers and family members from Uganda, providing them opportunities that they would not have had and quickly filling up his new home. At about the same time, I had completed my internship and had to move out of the doctor's mess. John found me a room on the same block where he was living and I became part of the family. John insisted that I do not cook in my room and that I should have all meals with the family. He also did not expect me to contribute to buy the food in the house. I remember him always going to Marikiti to buy sacks of Irish potatoes and green peas which were the staple at the house, and maybe what he could afford to feed such a large family. The tables had switched from me providing him with meals to him feeding me. This has always reminded me that you never know what the future holds. That is the John I got to know. For many years, we shared the life of a brother and a friend. We did a lot together and were there for each other. I'll share just two scenarios to show you who John was to me. After Pasa had arrived in Nairobi and they needed to formalize their marriage, John asked me to be his best man and witness to their marriage, which I was honored to do. Later, when I needed to visit my future in-laws for introductions, it was payback time, John became my parent. When my mother was ill and eventually passed away in Nairobi while I was away in the US, John took responsibility until I was able to travel back and ensure that we gave her a deserving funeral back in Uganda. Our greatest bond was based on mutual trust and respect, but most important in knowing that John would always tell me the truth, even when he knew it would hurt. Many of us will share our experiences with John, but I wanted to share this personal story to show you who John was even when he did not have much to share. He was always a family man, a philanthropist, and truthful to his friends and four alike. May his soul rest in eternal peace and may the good Lord enable those of us still here to carry forward his legacy. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Opio Loya, Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University here in London, Ontario. 
I am truly humbled to say a few words at the inaugural uh, Professor John Tamarich's lecture. Now, there is so much to say about my brother John. Of course, the word brother is sometimes used loosely as a term of endearment. In my case, I might have come from Gulu and John from Ibanda, but we were truly brothers. I first met John, his wife, Pelusi, and two little children, Barbara and Brenda, in the spring of 1985 at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He had completed his Master's of Laws at the University of Nairobi and enrolled at Queen's Law in the PhD program. Now, the very first day we met in their modest little townhouse, John decided we were brothers, and that was that. There was no arguing about it. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing he would hide from me. Issues would be discussed in my presence. He told me without mentioning his words, for example, to settle down and get married. That was John. John had a very sharp mind and very little patience. When he loved you, and he loved a lot of people, he gave you his full attention. He pushed himself to extend research in international law, which he started in Kenya. But he also pushed his wife, Pelusi, to do a master's in education. The evening at John's apartment were transformed into long strategy sessions. You woman, he would say lovingly to Pelusi, where is your essay? And then he would turn to me, my brother, what about your project? How is it coming along? I credit John for encouraging me to get into graduate school. Well, to be very honest with you, it was more than encouragement. Okay, he just told me flat out, Opio, you need to do your master's now instead of two years later. Uh, when I protested, I protested that I needed money uh, first, he said, what money? I will work hard and I'll give you the money that you need. So the next day I borrowed this old Russian built ladder vehicle and drove two hours away to the University of Ottawa to pick up the application form for the master's program. Uh, in those days, there were no online application. So we spent the next couple of days completing the application and writing all the essays that were needed to go with the application. And so in the summer of 1986, uh, I was accepted in the master's program at the University of Ottawa. Of course, it paved the way later for my PhD. So that was pure John. He believed in education as the equalizer and was relentless in pushing his own family and extended family to get an education, to go higher. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we all gathered here today in uh, memory of uh, my dear friend John. Uh, John and I met at Macquarie University. We were in the same residence, uh, Livingstone Hall, and John was quite impactful in terms of uh, how he interacted with me and any other persons that uh, shared the vision that we did and um, what was most important is the fact that John had the vision of uh, having a united country in the sense that we did not look at uh, uh, people from ethnic point of view, we look at ourselves as Ugandans and that is why our bond became very strong and has remained very strong and that will always be the biggest impact in my life in seeing that uh, although we are from different ethnic group, we share the same views and to me John is a brother to me and will always be a brother to me even in his uh, absence now. But uh, he lives through his uh, wife uh, Pelusi, uh, his uh, three children and he has brought into the world people who will carry his memory and excellent citizens for the country and for the world. 
and we all uh, pray for his soul to rest and peace. We all miss him and we'll continue to miss him, but we will carry on with the work that he had started. So I met in Tambiroch actually at Makere University because it was my lecture of international law during my third year at university. Mm. Uh, uh, if I was asked to describe him, I would say that John was John. He was in his own league. He, you couldn't compare him with anyone. First he was tall, athletic and handsome. And then he was extravagant with his uh, ideas and very articulate in expressing them. So when he was teaching us international law, it is rare to find a person with a command of a subject like him. I've studied in the best universities in the world. Oxford, Yale, Stanford, the London School of Economics, the London School of Oriental African Studies. I've been to Columbia, to Cornell, to whatever university you can choose, Harvard. John is among the best brains I ever came across. So when he came to teach us international law, John always came with a chalk. He never came with the notes at all or anything. And then he would begin discussing international law. You could get a book, you could get anything if you wanted to refer to the case, the headquarters opinion case of the UN or whichever case was before the International Court of Justice. He had command of it in his brain. I've never seen anything like that. I cannot remember any single lecturer in my life who taught me without notes and yet gave the best notes you could read. In fact, my international law notes, which I still have, I have, I have lent them to so many people later who have not studied international law at different universities. But John dictated those notes without referring to the book. He had mastered the subject after so many years that it just fell out of him. So that is one, extraordinary brilliance. But you can be brilliant and fail to be a good teacher. John was a very, very good teacher. He, was, he knew how to get ideas out of himself and inculcate them with the students in such an entertaining and intellectually stimulating way that it was so difficult for him to avoid attending his lecture. So attending his lecture was like uh, uh, eating chocolate or playing your most favorite game. Because I remember an incident when we were in the Constituent Assembly, me and my late friend Bob Kassam attending a debate on multi-party politics. Those were the days when Uganda was basking with this idealism of creating a democracy. So there was a debate, should Uganda have a movement system of government or a multi-party system of government? The multi-partists were some of the best political intellectuals Uganda had. And then there was the guys, the Kateigayas, they were on the other side, who were for the movement system, the Amanya Mushegas. So in terms of intellect, the debate was equally balanced. This was uh, what you call a clash between the brain titans. And it was so stimulating and of such national significance, you didn't want to leave. But then we had a lecture with John that same day. So we asked ourselves, we used to leave class at school to go and attend the Constituent Assembly debates. Me and Bob Kassam had to walk all the way from Conference Center back to McKinley University to attend John's lectures because they had no match in Uganda. There is no intellectual entertainment you get. Maybe the only computer would have been Mohammed Mokdani's lecture. So that is one. But two, he was very, he was not only generous with his ideas, he was generous with his time. Because then we became his friends. I used to visit his home. I would, his kids, like Barbara and Brenner, were little. I would play with them. His wife, I would eat there. So he would not only teach me, but he also parented me, uh, mentored me, and gave me access to himself and his family and his home. And which is very unique. It's rare to find a person like that. I remember one time we attended a, a debate at Makere University. And that's the picture you see. And there was uh, Tajuddin, who was the head of the Pan-African movement. movement. And you know, John was not keen on these things of Pan Africanism. And he was very critical of socialist ideas, these left wing ideas. But each time there was a debate between leftists and him on the right, 
between command economy and the free market economy. He would speak with flair and uh, confidence. One could even many people mistook his uh, his uh, reverence for arrogance because he spoke with such confidence. And sometimes he, with uh, some not so disguised contempt for people who are intellectually weak, <laughs> eh, that uh, I don't know how to describe it. And then he knew how to accept the audience. Most people who speak very intelligently don't attract a lot of applause. But John was able to express great ideas with such simplicity, such humor, and such style that he would even move a crowd to understand and cheer what he said. The greatest inter intellectuals, like Daniel Kahneman, for example, he can never appear on TV with his uh, Nobel Prize. He cannot be, uh, appear on TV in a debate and be as uh, command such presence. So John would combine his physical and athletic looks with great intellect, then humor and generosity and such extraordinary confidence. Eh? My name is Alan Kasuja. I am a senior journalist at the BBC. I am the host of Africa Daily, which is a podcast that deals with African issues. And I am also lead presenter of Newsday, which is the biggest breakfast show in the world. It is an honor to be able to pay tribute to Professor Tabi Rechi. And I want to say thank you very much to the family, to Mrs. Tabi Rechi to the children, Barbara, Brenda, Brian. Thank you very much for extending me this opportunity. My very first interaction with Professor Toby Rachel was when I was trying to get into law school. At the time, I didn't do well enough to go in on government scholarship, so I needed to pay my way through um, the course. So a requirement to be an evening student was that you faced a panel of lecturers, professors from the School of Law and uh, they asked you questions. The questions varied from why you wanted to become a lawyer, whether you had the brains for it, the patience, the focus, and also the financial means to go through the course and interrupt it. And I remember whereas all the other professors, Professor Kakosa, Professor Juko, I think, and others were asking me questions about my capacity uh, to pay for the course and all other questions. Professor Tabi Rechi wanted to know about me. Who am I? What's my philosophy? What are my aspirations? What are my dreams? His presence, his beard, his character, his level of engagement, <laughs> that was memorable. And uh, I met him a few times on campus, he was very gracious, always remembered who I was, remembered my name, kept asking how I was doing. Um, and also, eventually, you know, when I left to go and do other things, um, when I met him, it was a very gracious conversation. I think one of the things that I learned about him, about his greatness, was, not this, was never from him as a person. It was from what other people said of him. And uh, this man, if it was up to him, he would have wanted everybody in Uganda to be a lawyer. He was a teacher, a real teacher who concerned himself not just to the performance of a student, but also beyond that, the welfare of the student. You know, there are so many people who have paid tribute to him since he passed away, and that in itself 
has been a motivation for me, a personal challenge. You know, when you hear students saying that I'm a lawyer now because Professor Antabirechi took me to law school, and that I come from a family that could never have afforded the school fees, but I was given the opportunity to study by Professor Antabirechi. When you hear people like my friend Andrew Wenda saying that to them he was a parent and a friend, and in many ways a confidant. When you hear from women who sell at markets that he used to stop on his way to his home village just so he could buy from them, and that might have been the only income they had that day, that he remembered them, that even when he was unwell, he still stopped and interacted with them, that for me is inspiring. And that for me is the ultimate definition of impact. How do you live your life? You live your life to impact other people's lives. So if I'm gracious, if I extend anything, any courtesy to anybody, especially people who are much younger than me, it's because of people like Professor Tony Rich, people who see you, who hear you, who see your dreams, and who help you achieve those dreams. His name will live on for a very long time. There will be people who will testify of his greatness for a very, very long time. I honor him so much and I pray that he continues to rest in peace. But I also honor his family. I thank you again. You know, I honor Mrs. Tamirechi. She's a fighter, a soldier. She epitomizes commitment. And there are lessons to be learned from that as well. And also the children that they have raised. Barbara, Brenda, Brian. May God bless you. May God give you the fortitude you need to continue with life after the passing of your great, great father. May God bless you all. My name is Dr. Monica Magoke Mpoja from Tanzania. I met the late Professor John when I joined the board of Akode. He was such a joyful man, loving, kind, and the things which are very memorable to me is when he really tried to speak with me in Kiswahili. Haveria Tanzania, Hawajambo Tanzania, and he will be laughing and giving me stories about Tanzania. Wow! And you know, smiling, laughing is good for our health. And the very important thing which has reminded with me is his good leadership skills especially when he was giving guidance you know a chairing the board of a calling he was such a man with wisdom solving some of the problems very very simply a loving father as well so god bless you love to the family he has really lived a great mark in my heart and i've learned leadership skills from him god bless you all thank you very much my name is uh, josephine odera 
and uh, I worked with uh, John Tambiriche both at the University of Nairobi and also at Accord, Uganda. I first met John at the University of Nairobi around 1989. I just joined the teaching staff and here comes this big burly professor and he addresses me as Josephine. I see you have joined the staff. And we had a good laugh around that. I could see that he was uh, experienced already. And over time, we got to talk and do seminars together, present papers at similar events. And then finally, we met at Accord, where he was the chair, and I became his deputy. What I found really interesting about John was uh, his knowledge of African history and also how he um, interacted with people, big, both big and small. I was particularly touched by how he was involved in Uganda's liberation movement, second liberation, I would say, and how he was so closely associated with many other struggles in Africa and his close knowledge of what was happening in those countries. Of course, his knowledge on the environment was something else, and environmental law in particular. Um, John was this sort of person who could make you feel big, even though you were small. Uh, he could uh, make you feel very confident about what you're doing. John never set out to make people feel inadequate. He always brought out the positive in people and tried to help as many people as possible. And above all, he was a very jolly person, a boisterous in nature, and uh, a person that you could easily speak to about different things in life. Um, I've taken now, over now as the chair of Accord and trying to walk in uh, John's footsteps. Still feeling somehow inadequate because John could reach so, so many people and uh, was always so very helpful. So we miss him, but we appreciate all that he did. Hi, dear friends. I just like to say that I'm very honored to have been given the opportunity to say a few words in honor of my friend and colleague, uh, Professor John Ntabireki. I met John as a young lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He was much older, but I had just joined in 1990 and uh, he had the office next to mine. And so that meant that if I had anything that I needed to ask, I stepped into his office. I developed a close friendship with him. And uh, it is not surprising that when he went to work for the UN environment, I went uh, and did a consultancy there and worked with him. I would also say that uh, in later years, John and I met as academics of law and we shared times without number how we wanted the legal uh, landscape to be. John was an idealist and he was a person who wanted to see good ideas come to fruition. I was not surprised when he left Makerere and uh, went and founded the law school at Grotius. And uh, I interacted with him as a board member of uh, the Ad Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment. He was the chair. And each time that John and I met, we reminisced about our old days at the University of Nairobi. But we also shared how we wanted to see the law uh, landscape develop. I had uh, occasion to be the chair of the Kenya School of Law and I met 
students that had come from Grotius Law School and many of them were really grounded and I did give this feedback to John. Uh, John was really a fine mind. Not long ago I met a colleague, Professor Kelly. Professor Ke Patrick Kelly uh, is an emeritus professor at Widener University. Widener had a program that they brought to the University of Nairobi every summer. And uh, we, we taught the students in Nairobi, they visited UNEP, but uh, that stopped uh, just before COVID. I met Kelly not too long ago, we had dinner, he had visited uh, Kenya with his wife and he asked me, where is John? And he was really shocked when I told him that John was no longer with us. And he said, and I quote, he was one of the finest minds that I had interacted with. That was John. I, I would say that uh, we lost uh, a gallant soldier. Uh, there were many people working on environment. Uh, Professor John Okidi, Charles Okidi rather, is uh, famed as uh, the father of environmental law. And if he was the father of environmental law, because I believe he was older than John, then maybe John was either the younger father or he was an, a grand uncle of environmental law. I would just like to tell the family, Mrs. Ntabireki, we met um, uh, when you just uh, retired from uh, UNICEF when uh, I came to see John when he wasn't feeling well and he was in hospital. And we knew you when you were in Nairobi. I would like to say that uh, we lost uh, a good friend and uh, I do look forward uh, when I am done with my tour of duty as an international civil servant to getting back into the academy. And uh, I can assure you that uh, the university that you are now chancellor of will be one of the spaces that I will make a pit stop at. Barbara, uh, continue to work on uh, biotechnology you are stepping into the grand shoes of your daddy and we are here to spur you along thank you and uh, wish you all happy memories and uh, remembrances of our friend and gallant soldier gone to be with the lord I came to know the late Professor John Nabrechi in the early 90s, but started interacting with him in the year 2002 when he became my lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Makerere University. Professor John Nabrechi was very passionate about knowledge generation and dissemination, and beyond lecturing, he carried out research and informed a number of laws uh, in this country. John Nabrechi influenced my career as a researcher, policy analyst, and environmental rights advocate. Minister for Local Government and Member of Parliament of Nyangabo County and the citizen of Toro. Distinguished guests in your various capacities, Bishop Ruenzori Diocese, members of academic and administrative staff of this university in your various ranks, members of the academic community from other universities, the clergy, Representatives of local governments, 
graduates, students of this university, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great pleasure to be here for the seventh occasion to welcome you to the Uganda Pentecostal University to attend this congregation and witness the graduations of these young citizens of East Africa in the various ranks as will be demonstrated in the graduation ceremonies. I would now like to thank my friends, the graduates, who today will go through the transition from pupil to master. You came to us to study, and we have attempted to make you the best we could. We shall be happy with the persons we have instructed. An old theologian, Thomas Kempis, who lived between 1380 and 1471 AD, observed in his book, The Imitation of Christ, in chapter 16, that be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. We, the university, are happy to have done our job, and now release you to the bigger teacher, which is the world. In that bigger world, please hear and follow the teachings of those great men of learning, to whom we have exposed you. And remember, continue reading. Ladies and gentlemen, go into the world with modesty. Recognize your limits and your extent. Then you will be sure to go forward. It was one cold morning in June, July of 1981 in Nairobi when a friend, Patrick Kibundu, who was at the Kenya School of Law, walked into my little apartment in the doctor's mess at Kenyatta National Hospital with John. I had never met John before and had no idea why they had come that early. John had arrived that morning from Uganda. Patrick went ahead to introduce us and state why he had brought John to my apartment. John had just escaped from Uganda, fearing for his life under the regime at the time. Some of us attending today will be familiar with this story. Patrick made sure to let me know that we might have different political convictions, but we all cared about our country's destiny and the need for, for, for to be there for each other. We then agreed to share our responsibility for supporting John to settle in. John had been robbed on arrival at the Akamba bus station and did not have any means of survival. Patrick would provide accommodation and would provide meals while John found his way. We did not have to do this for long as John quickly found his way around and got a job as a teacher at a private school downtown and found his own accommodation in his sleep. A one bedroom a one-bedroom apartment, as that is all he could afford. John was in a hurry to get his own place because he had left Pase in Uganda and wanted her to come and join him as quickly as possible. They were expecting a baby, and he could not imagine not being there for the birth of their first child. Within about 12 months, John had established himself and moved to slightly bigger accommodation. Being the philanthropist, he was uh, taking his family role seriously. John started bringing over his brothers and family members from Uganda, providing them opportunities that they would not have had, and quickly filling up his new home. At about the same time, I had completed my internship and had to move out of the doctor's mess. John found me a room on the same block where he was living, and I became part of the family. John insisted that I do not cook in my room and that I should have all meals with the family. He also did not expect me to contribute to buying the food in the house. 
I remember him always going to Marikiti to buy sacks of Irish potatoes and green peas, which were the staple at the house, and maybe what he could afford to feed such a large family. The tables had switched from me providing him with meals to him feeding me. This has always reminded me that you never know what the future holds. That is the John I got to know. For many years, we shared the life of a brother and a friend. We did a lot together and were there for each other. I'll share just two scenarios to show you who John was to me. After Pasa had arrived in Nairobi and they needed to formalize their marriage, John asked me to be his best man and witness to their marriage, which I was honored to do. Later, when I needed to visit my future in-laws for introductions, it was payback time. John became my parent. When my mother was ill and eventually passed away in Nairobi while I was away in the U.S., John took responsibility until I was able to travel back and ensure that we gave her a deserving funeral back in Uganda. Our greatest bond was based on mutual trust and respect, but most important in knowing that John would always tell me the truth, even when he knew it would hurt. Many of us will share our experiences with John, but I wanted to share this personal story to show you who John was even when he did not have much to share. He was always a family man, a philanthropist, and truthful to his friends and four alike. May his soul rest in eternal peace and may the good Lord enable those of us still here to carry forward his legacy. Thank you. Greetings, I'm Opio Lawyer, Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University here in London, Ontario. I am truly humbled to say a few words at the inaugural uh, Professor John Tamarechi's lecture. Now there is so much to say about my brother John. Of course the word brother is sometimes used loosely as a term of endearment. In my case, I might have come from Gulu and John from Ibanda. But we were truly brothers. I first met John, his wife Pelusi, and two little children, Barbara and Brenda, in the spring of 1985 at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He had completed his Master's of Laws at the University of Nairobi and enrolled at Queen's Law in the PhD program. Now, the very first day we met in their modest little townhouse, John decided we were brothers, and that was that. There was no arguing about it. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing he would hide from me. Issues would be discussed in my presence. He told me without mentioning his words, for example, to settle down and get married. That was John. John had a very sharp mind and very little patience. When he loved you, and he loved a lot of people, he gave you his full attention. He pushed himself to extend research in international law, which he started in Kenya. But he also pushed his wife, Pelusi, to do a master's in education. The evening at John's apartment were transformed into long strategy sessions. You woman, he would say lovingly to Pelusi, where is your essay? And then he would turn to me, my brother, what about your project? How is it coming along? I credit John for encouraging me to get into graduate school. Well, to be very honest with you, it was more than encouragement. Okay, he just told me flat out, Opio, you need to do your master's now instead of two years later. Uh, when I protested, I protested that I needed money uh, first, he said, what money? I will work hard and I'll give you the money that you need. So the next day I borrowed this old Russian built ladder vehicle and drove two hours away to the University of Ottawa to pick up the application form for the master's program. Uh, in those days, there were no online application. So we spent the next couple of days completing the application and writing all the essays that were needed to go with the application. 
And so in the summer of 1986, I was accepted in the master's program at the University of Ottawa. Of course, it paved the way later for my PhD. So that was Pure John. He believed in education as the equalizer and was relentless in pushing his own family and extended family to get an education, to go higher. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we all gathered here today in uh, memory of uh, my dear friend John. Uh, John and I met at Macquarie University. We were in the same residence, uh, Livingstone Hall, and John was quite impactful in terms of uh, how he interacted with me and any other persons that uh, shared the vision that we did and um, what was most important is the fact that John had the vision of uh, having a united country in the sense that we did not look at uh, uh, people from ethnic point of view, we look at ourselves as Ugandans and that is why our bond became very strong and has remained very strong and that will always be the biggest impact in my life in seeing that uh, although we are from different ethnic group, we share the same views and to me John is a brother to me and will always be a brother to me even in his uh, absence now. But uh, To come and usher us into this segment and uh, make some announcements. Thank you so much Dennis. Uh, I just because I people were seated. By the time I introduced people, a lot of people had, um, maybe I didn't see, but I wanted to take this one minute. There is one minute to recognize. I would like to recognize John Kiza, my brother. I don't, hey, he's there. Came all the way from Kampala. I would like to co recognize Mr. I is your classmate. You are his classmate, apparently. And Ignis uh, Igundura uh, came all the way from Uganda. Uh, bless you, Tigambirwa. I don't know, he may have walked, but he's my son with a lot of gray hair. And, um, oh, you're there. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, all these are family members. Bless you. Um, Tina Nabunji, did I speak about you before? Uh, yeah, it's my daughter here. She's also a lawyer. Everybody around me are lawyers except me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Director Lauben and, and Pius, uh, there you are. Um, Council Mouez, Anton and Jemima, yeah, good to see you. Uh, and the media, the fourth estate that is here. But I really wanted to take a little bit of time and appreciate this man because uh, I met him at the VCs forum and uh, I said, wow. And when I introduced myself, he came running. I said, I know that man. I said, ooh. Anyway, Dennis Lukaya is at MAST and you can see he's really, really gifted in moderating. Uh, he can make you promise <laughs> heaven and earth. And uh, thank you so much, Dennis. We did this together. We did it eh? here, Bonga. Yes, we were able, the ideas, the everything, and he put me to task. I really, really can't, you, I can't thank you enough. I wanted to reserve this for, for towards the end. And I really need to clap for him in a special way, not the other one. We just said, oh, uh, yeah, and then we directed all of that to him. Yes, and, uh, and before I go, of course, I can't... Uh, I can't fail to recognize James Kamanyira and your wife. Where are you sitting? Oh, there you are. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really, I can't introduce each and everyone, but I'm so grateful that you're here. Sebo, Dennis, here you go. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. I am honored. It is uh, exciting. And thank you too for accepting a number of uh, uh, recommendations. Probably I'm happy you are not joining Tambiru because they told us he would refuse his ideas. But you accepted many of the ideas and this is the day we were dreaming about. Thank you. Thank you. And we will continue to offer time and support to UPU. It's a good family. It's a good family. It's a good family. So, uh, Barbara, are you ready? We would like Barbara to lead us through the launch of the foundation so that we... So... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC, Mr. Dennis Lukaya, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I just want to introduce myself once again. My name's uh, Barbara Kobmanzi Ntambirechi. Um, <laughs> yes, and um, I'm really, really honored to stand here before you uh, on this very great day of the 12th of February, 2024. Um, it's been 10 months since uh, dad passed, and I really want to thank God for how he has taken us through these 10 months. Um, it's been hard, but somehow God has really been there for us. Um, I have family here with me as we discuss uh, and launch the John Intern Retchy Foundation. I would like to invite my family. When we were growing up, um, it was never about us. It was always about family. So I would like to introduce, I would like to call my family to stand here as I talk about dad. Uh, and I'll start with my sister, Navunje. I'll start with my brother, Simon. Um, Anthony, please come. Um, Jas, please come. Lauben. Uh, and I want you to see Lauben. When we look at Lauben, he is a complete replica of dad. Sometimes I look at him and I uh, <laughs> get scared. Love, Pius, um, Rose, Rose, oh, oh. Noreen, Newton. Uh, I want us to stand here and launch the John and Tambrechi Foundation. Who else have I forgotten? Joshua. Is Joshua there? Mujeni, Job, okay, so all of us, uh, I'm not going to, are we all of us single? Some of us are not single. <laughs> okay, there are some who are single, some who are half, some are full, but uh, for us, it's an honor to be a Musingo. I always say that because that's how I was born and bred. Uh, and I used to tell people, even in primary school, ah, my dad, he's a singer, he'll come for you. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so really, um, as we stand here to launch uh, John Intermetry Foundation, it will be, you know, one that's under the heading of, you know, he was a trailblazer in education, he shaped minds, he changed lives, and we are remembering John Intermetry. Before we go into the launch of John Tambrechi, I want to say that I also bring you greetings from my siblings who are not able to come, who are not able to be with us today. Uh, like, Ma, uh, like the Vice Chancellor, um, <laughs> like the Vice Chancellor noted in her speech, my sister Brenda lives in Ireland and she has just started a new job. She was not able to be here. My brother Brian is also in Nairobi and unable to join us today. And I have two other siblings, Max and Melissa, who are in school and are not able to be here. Um, I'll start by saying that dad was an eminent scholar. He was an educator. He was a visionary leader. His impact has reverberates far beyond the borders of Uganda. He was a giant, not only in stature, but with a big heart that touched the lives of many 
friends and foes alike. Before I delve into who and what the John Tambachi Foundation is about, allow me to welcome you all to the great land of Toro. I would like to specifically welcome uh, our family members who are here. Uh, I would like to start by welcoming Uncle Joffrey Kandere. Please stand up. Um, I'd like to welcome Uncle Igundura. Please stand up. And I would like to welcome Uncle James Kamanire and, um, and their wives. Sorry, Mr. and Mrs., please forgive me. <laughs> and Auntie Jolie, all the way from Barara. And Christine, thank you very much for coming here as family. Uh, we're really honored that you'd stand here with us. Um, before I really go into the John Tambridge Foundation, allow me to thank all our sponsors for this event. It's been a tough um, three or four months, but we've had so many blessings. And that's what you see when they talk about dad and his impact. And so many people willing to give a hand to make this, uh, to make this function a success. I'd like to start by thanking Accord. Accord, by the way, is responsible for mentoring me. I am here because of what Accord. I spent 13 years working for Accord. And um, it has been an interesting journey. Without Accord, I wouldn't stand here. Um, but right now, actually, I'm a Stanford fellow. And I am a researcher. And I work for another international organization. So I would like to thank um, Dr. Maggie Chigozi. Thank you very much for all the support. For all the Pepsi products you see on your tables, thank you very much. And generally, for being a great support to UPU, we are really grateful for everything you've done for us. Um, I'd like to thank um, Ms. Honorable William Biarhanga, who was not able to come here. But I met him in person, and he gave me a very generous contribution. And he also has been very generous with uh, the other um, for what should I say, facilities that he owns. Uh, he has really been there and given us um, really good donation that has made this um, function a success. Last but not least, I want to thank Uncle Nathan Karema. Uncle Nathan, I, as usual, I never have words for you because really you've been a friend and a friend that all of us should emulate. Uh, I look at your friendship with dad in life, in death. You, you still remain... Uncle Nathan, thank you so much. So, um, oh, but I also want to thank Dr. Sorry, Dennis Lukaya. There is so much that we can say about what you have done. And I, I don't know the back and forth, the, the intellectual input. And just, you know, you, your love for, for Mze is amazing. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And... Thank you so much, last but not least, sorry, I'm saying last but not least, <laughs> the Toro Prime Minister who is here, who has sat the entire day. Honestly, we are honored that you, you are here, and we would like to thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, who was Professor John? I will say his name that never liked to be heard, but let me say it because I now know he will not find me anywhere. So, Professor John Tibateka Teka. Ntambirwechi, mm. who was he? Um, Dad was an eminent scholar. He was a visionary. He was a leader. He was a colossus that really uh, contributed to international law, to laws around the world. Dad has been there, and he has contributed to so many laws, policies at global, at global, at the global level, at the international level. Um, Dad was part of that. So Dad was born in 1955 in Kagonj Kashari to Ermonsi and Evangeline Tambirochi, and his journey towards excellence and service began at Makobore High School, Kinyasano, in Rukunji District, where he obtained an ordinary school certificate in 1973. He furthered his education at Nabmali High School in Baale District and earned an advanced school certificate in 1975. In 1976, he embarked on his pursuit 
for legal studies at Macquarie University in 1979 with a bachelor's law degrees and distinguished among the top 1% uh, top of his class. And during his time at Macquarie, he had, you know, he had illustrious peers such as Honorable Jim Mwezi, David Tinyefuza, and others. Professor John Tamechi's journey took a turn towards public service when he joined intelligence under President Godfrey Benaisa in 1979, followed by military training in Cuba that uh, Uncle Nathan talked about. And however, political upheavals have led him to seek refuge in Kenya in 1981, where he enrolled for his Master of Laws degree at the University of Nairobi. His thirst for knowledge and commitment to justice propelled him to Canada in 1984, where he pursued a doctoral studies at Queen's University, Toronto. Despite not completing his doctorate, he was appointed as a lecturer at the University of Nairobi, marking the beginning of a distinguished academic career. Over the years, Professor John Ntambrechi's expertise in law and environmental governance garnered international recognition. He, has, he served as a consultant to prestigious organizations such as UNEP, UNDP and FAO spanning numerous countries across Africa and beyond. In 2001, he embarked on the groundbreaking endeavor to found the Gocha School of Law, later rebranded as the Uganda Pentecostal University in 2005, where he was vice chancellor until his passing in April 2022. His commitment to expanding access to higher education transformed countless lives and left an indelible mark on the East African academic landscape. Throughout his illustrious career, Professor Ntambreshi has remained dedicated to advancing environmental law and education, publishing prolifically, and sharing his expertise as a visiting professor at esteemed institutions worldwide. Today, as we reflect on his life's work, we honor Professor John Ntambreshi's enduring legacy as a beacon of knowledge, integrity, and compassion, and may his passion for education continue continue to inspire generations to come. Who are we about the John Tamrechi Foundation? The John Tamrechi Foundation is a non-profit organization committed to preserving and enduring the legacy of Professor John in the field of education in East, uh, in East Africa and his significant contributions to international and environmental sustainability. The foundation is legally incorporated and registered under Ugandan law as the John Intermerchi Trust Limited, operating as a com company limited by guarantee. Um, we, what do we want to see? We want to see a society where every individual in East Africa has an equitable access to higher education and where preserving biodiversity in the African ecosystem is a priority. And this was one of the major discussions that we had today where everyone has access to equitable uh, higher education and inclusion. Uh, that was one of his greatest um, um, standpoints. The other objective we really want to see out of the John Tamrechi Foundation is that we want to facilitate ongoing education to various segments of the community in Uganda and globally. Uh, we want to promote capacity building in students the holistic development of liberal and scientific educational reforms, and we want to support research in natural resources and environmental conservation for sustainable development. Um, one of the other things that we really want to do is that we want to advocate for accepting endowments, donations, and assistance to advance the foundation's activities effectively. I'd like to say that uh, there's a huge discussion here today about um, the need for land for the university. That's one of the things that the John Tamrechi Foundation is going to pursue to ensure that uh, his legacy continues and that we uh, build on the land that we already have. And Honorable Hunda, if there's more land, we welcome it. <laughs> we will build another campus uh, because um, we have the capacity and the capabilities as a foundation. We have, been, we have uh, a number of activities uh, that are scheduled every other quarter, and one of the activities uh, 
that we've just had is the annual memorial lecture in collaboration with the Uganda Pentecostal University. Uh, we have been participating in the annual cleaning of the banks of River Mpanga in Kabarole district in collaboration with UPU and the local community. We want to continue this. And we don't just want to stop in Kabarole. We want to go further across uh, to Chitagwenda, to all the river banks that cut across uh, these districts. Um, the annual Professor John Tamrochi Memorial Sports and Talent Identification is also another area that we really want to um, harness. And these tournaments will serve as a platform to promote various co-curricular activities and engage students in diverse pursuits. Uh, already we have a very vibrant, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, soccer team, soccer team here at UPU, and we believe that we can do more with that team to ensure that we foster awareness in schools and we support access to higher education. Um, in the quarter four, we want to start a continuous tree planting exercise in and around Fort Porto City, around, uh, I mean, all the other districts that align closely with the Sustainable Development Goal of 15, which is saying by planting trees, we are directly contributing to the protecting, restoring, and promoting sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. This will be a core uh, aspect of the John Tambrechi Foundation. And uh, we already have a tree champion here, Mr. Simon Muhumuza, who <laughs> has been doing it uh, on his own, but we are going to join forces and do more uh, tree planting. So what outcome do we want to see? We want to see a positive impact um, fostering meaningful change throughout East Africa, directly influencing lives of hundreds through the Foundation's impactful initiatives. And we will elevate the credibility of the Foundation through um, your esteemed participation um, as leaders, as partners uh, with causes that you're deeply passionate about. So we want to call upon all of you who are passionate about um, the goals and objectives that we've just uh, talked about here. We want to ask you to join us to ensure that our, the, the legacy of Professor John Tambrechi lives on for generations and generations. So, um, without further ado, I uh, will ask a few family members to join us um, as we launch uh, the John Tambrechi Foundation, and I'll ask uh, Dennis to lead us in that one. Um, I don't know whether we are going to that part or we go to we go that side. So, I'll call upon um, Chancellor. Hey, later. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll invite the Chancellor, please, to join us, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Chair of Council, um, Board Members, the Prime Minister of Toro, please join us, uh, Honorable Ruhunda, please join us, uh, Uncle Geoffrey, please join us, and eh? Uncle James Kamanyere, please join us, Ingra, as a key, I don't even know why you sat. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, and some panels of the day we would like to go to the other corner, and then yeah, she's a good man. Yeah. Uncle Igundura, please join us as we launch the John Tambrechi Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. 
So sign. They are going to use one. This one was not my idea. Direct. Uh uh. Uh uh. Good. The accord people tend to sign in big letters. Uh -huh. That is now the real signature of a, a financial advisor. The Right Honorable Prime Minister of Toro Kingdom. I don't know which color. Put down here, yes, around that area. The Vice Chancellor. as well <laughs> I 
Auntie Jolly. Auntie Jolly. Has someone seen Auntie Jolly? Deputy Prime Minister of the Toro Kingdom, the Speaker of the Assembly of the Great People of Toro, going to request that uh, we have a group photo. I would need some chairs. Oh, the board. Okay. Okay. Then the rest of us will continue to. Auntie Irene. Auntie Irene. The last get best. Right at the Rio thing. I'm kindly going to request us to assemble for a group photo. Ashers, bring me some six or so chairs here, please. Or some well wishers, those very seats. Let me have six of them here. The Chancellor, Chair of Council, the Prime Minister, the Honorable Member of Parliament. request our Chancellor, Chair of Council, Vice-Chancellor, the Prime Minister, the Honorable Prime Minister of Toro, the Honorable Alex Runda, the Deputy Prime Minister, board members, please. We could sprinkle ourselves well in terms of gender. <laughs> Uncle Geoffrey, that last seat automatically is a, is a preserve. We could uh, take that photo. We could take that photo. Uh, Barbara, your siblings, and everybody, we can go to the back now. The team could stay where it is. The team, as you called it out, please. Just help leave the John Intambrechi signatures visible. Just a little bit. That's okay. That's good. And uh, the siblings, there is a way you are not uh, properly organized. Eh? Really, that was not professor's way of standing. Mm. Let everybody be on the at the front. Yeah. You will be sent to Cuba in a Kawe later. I request uh, the rest of the members of the board, uncles and aunties also, please join the siblings. You can naturally find yourselves away. <laughs> Council members, 
Nukos uh, Barbara you cannot excuse yourself in the center there that we can now say the John Intambirechi Foundation is officially launched. The John Intambirechi Foundation is officially launched. I don't know whether the, we shall now have vacancies. We could also announce and people apply from here. They will apply online. Online. We say thank you to Professor John Tambirechi for his pioneering work in education and here we are to further that dream and that story. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The team from Kenya, where are you? The team from Kenya. Let's return and do the official closing. Let's take our seats and do the official closing. The team from Kenya. The Vice Chancellor, please take a photo with the team from Kenya. The Kenyan team. And uh, we'll also ask you to say something just before we leave here. With the Chancellor, yes. say something while you're here? Okay, on behalf of uh, the alumni fraternity, especially from Kenya, we are grateful to associate ourselves with this great university because we understand the impact which this given university has played uh, uh, in our lives and uh, it's our hope that as the alumni body will come together and see how best we can support not only the university but also this newly launched foundation thank you for hosting us we feel much welcome and thank you for the love as well may prof soul rest in peace mm -hmm. i hope when you are going home you each one of you took a chitoro name what is your empako aboki uh -huh, aboki so let's kindly resettle. Finally, we just have a minute or two. We say a closing prayer and uh, officially dedicate the day with a word of prayer. Please let us take our seats. We will have a prayer for dedication of the foundation. Thank the good Lord for today. And we can officially close this ceremony. In terms of call to action, we really have uh, 
the task to ensure that in all our individual capacities, we do something about ensuring access to higher education. We thank all those who are already doing uh, something, and we know that UPU has been and is a pillar in access to higher education. As we get ready for the dedication prayer, Uncle Geoffrey, Uncle Geoffrey, on behalf of the family, we request that you give us a vote of thanks. Please come and express a vote of thanks on behalf of the family. And after that, we'll call uh, Father Adolf, who will uh, dedicate and give us a closing uh, prayer. Then we will have the anthem. Uh, Madam Chancellor, uh, the Chair, University Council, Top University Management, uh, all the invited guests, uh, my boss, you know I also serve on one of the committees of Toro, the one for negotiation and return of the kingdom property. I'm one of the I'm one of the four lawyers, but the, the fourth has since become a judge. So we are three who are remaining on that committee, who were appointed by the king. So for about four years or so, we have been negotiating with the government of Uganda on the return of the Toro Kingdom property. Uh, the protocol has been observed so I will not go through it in any case I don't have the list as the MC has put it mine is a short one on behalf of the family uh, is to move a vote of thanks uh, first of all I want to thank the organizers uh, of this lecture who put in resources and time to organize and ensure uh, where we have reached so far, the day has been a success. Please give them a clap of hand. Thank you so much for organizing, and I am informed that this lecture is going to be annual. Uh, we wish you all the best to ensure, I don't know whether it will be this particular day, alternating days on different days, Then you thank those who have, oh, it is you, to thank all those who have come. <laughs> hey, you have to turn and, and look at them and thank them who are attending online. Uh, thank you for keeping with us. It has been a long day, and all this shows the love and the trust and admiration that you had uh, in our big brother, Professor John Tandorechi, uh, the late. Uh, please keep it up. Uh, I was able to see uh, the good parts, uh, most of the parts uh, of the video. And most of the friends I saw there, I have seen them before. They are his old friends that I have known, plus those new ones and uh, who have come. When he was still looking after us, uh, Dr. Pio Roya, Dr. Magua, uh, these are people who are always with uh, Professor Antandruwechi. Uh, I remember some years back, around 1992, 
who was 95 there. Dr. Opio Roya came from Canada and went all the way to our village. So he is a real brother. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Opio Roya, uh, if you are online, for keeping with us uh, for more than a generation. I think that is more than a generation. Since a generation is 25 years. Uh, I want to, on behalf of the family, to thank all the speakers who have spoken here, all the kind words that you have spoken about my big brother, uh, my big brother and mentor. Uh, this time I will just uh, tell only a short one as to why I am a lawyer. I am a lawyer uh, because Professor Tandruchi was a lawyer. Uh, when we were joining senior two, I was asked by, I had come from, uh, uh, they used to call it third world school. Now I went to a powerful school which had A level and whatever and I had never interacted with A level students. So now as we had joined the uh, A level, no not A level, as we had joined senior two, one of the classmates asked me, what is your combination? I said, Chichi, what is your combination? I said, what is the combination? I had never heard of that word combination. I said, now you see a combination. He told me what it means. When you go to senior three, you choose subjects. Then in senior five, you reduce the subjects to three. I didn't even know that in A level they were studying only three subjects. <laughs> then he said, the subjects you choose now to concentrate on and senior three are. Uh, are, what, are going to determine what you will even study at university and what course you will take. Then he asked me, by the way, what do you want to study when you go to the university? I said, I want to be a lawyer. Because it was the only thing that I knew and it was the only degree that was close to me that I had uh, seen some years earlier, huh? about to eight or six years earlier. Uh, so, uh, the inspiration for me to become a lawyer, besides him paying school fees and mentoring me, it was him that I thought that I could become a lawyer. So I am a lawyer because he was. Uh, so that is something, a permanent mark that will always move with me, that I became a lawyer because he was. Uh, uh, Akiki, I will not go back to 1979 this time. I will leave it at that. Uh, now, uh, allow me to to say that uh, uh, yes, I listened, but uh, first of all, I also want to thank the keynote speak, uh, speaker, uh, Professor Kabudi, uh, for making that wonderful uh, lecture and taking time to deliver it to us. And really, if you had not managed to make it, the whole day would have come to naught. So thank you for remembering your colleague and putting in time to prepare this keynote address. And uh, I was about to say that of all the other speakers, I had them, but I would only highlight one. And that is Dr. Eric Jitter, Principal Education Officer, who talked about education policy in Uganda. And I was uh, seated with uh, uh, Honorable Ruhunda there. Uh, his talk intrigued me, and it took me to around 210, where I dealt with education policy, almost the way he talked. From the 1940s to 1950s to 1963, the white paper that led to the Education Act of 1970. And actually, I scratched my head, say, wasn't there another Education Act 1964? I looked for it, I found that it was not there. Then uh, it brought me to uh, the white paper of Mshega, which you are mentioning of 1992. And it came from the Kajuri report. Uh, is the one who wrote that white paper that he... Uh, uh, Major Mshega presented to Minister of Education. So, as you were talking, I was together with you. Because that topic gave me a hard time around the year 2011, 
that I had to go through all that history when we were arguing a case of uh, Butime, uh, Kano Butime versus Honare Bomhumza. Then again, I met it in 2016 in the case of Florence Chintu, somebody versus, and now, incidentally, Honare Bomhumza Chintu is going to graduate, I'm told, this week as a lawyer. So you can see what that policy did. And her case in 2016, that was now in Masaka, where she was an MP, and uh, Karungu and former LOC5 chairperson. Yes. Was it 2011 also? Aha. Uh -huh. Then, now she came all the way, I hope. The way I argued the case, it inspired her to come and study uh, the bachelor's of rose from here. Now she was telling me that she's going to graduate. So, uh, I congratulate you in advance, Honorable Jintu. And I've also been told that she has enrolled for a master's. So, what a nice talk, Dr. Jita, uh, that you made for me and uh, some of the people who know what education policy and those uh, things that you are talking about. But uh, we hope, uh, on my personal note, that uh, government does not become obsessed with science only. Because hmm? it can't be science all the time, as uh, my land Musingo was saying here, Dr. Mujenji, that we should now change to science. We need administrators, we need accountants, we need whatever. Uh, uh, they usually say the lawyers are too much. Somebody was saying that the lawyer cannot be, is it? Cannot be kind of by nature of training and something like that. But Ntangruwechi uh, was very kind and uh, he would always dispense with his fees. So lawyers can be kind at times and they do pro bono. So uh, that education, also you need lab attendants, you need cleaners, you need carpenters. Not everybody can be a scientist. Hmm? You, otherwise you'll be like those communist countries. Is it Vietnam? Where they went and said, whoever has a degree, we should, uh, I know Dr. Karema knows those ones very well. When the communists took over Vietnam, and they killed everybody who had a degree. Also the French, so please, we can have science, but also arts, and these other subjects must remain. So I have uh, talked a lot. Uh, mine was to move a vote of thanks. Uh, 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 Madam Chancellor, thank you for making time. Though it is not a graduation day, to come and be with us and honor this occasion. And I want to thank all of us who have sat through from 12 midday or even before up to now when we are almost coming to a close with a prayer. Thank you so much and I hope we meet in another lecture next year. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for the vote of thanks. We continue to thank all our sponsors. Um, uh, I think everybody saw a Pepsi today. All its cousins. Eh? Pepsi Oye? Oye. Pepsi Oye? Oye? Please, when you go home, recognize that Pepsi is that drink that brings fortitude, opportunity, and well-being. Pepsi. Accord, thank you very, very much. Uh, Dr. Mesmas, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is so many apt media, uh, UPU, uh, now Johnny Tambirechi Foundation, Stan Big Bank, we had uh, ZNCDE, then Ultimate. Uh, I keep seeing Pepsi, I don't know why. Yes, Voice of Toro, Toro Kingdom, you know, I don't want to miss any, Mountains of the Moon, uh, Hotel was it? Yes, Inyangsi, yes, any that you remember? Stan Dick, yes, we said, I even said Pepsi, <laughs> so... Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Now we really need to close with a word of prayer. We dedicate the foundation. We 
put in an evening prayer for Professor Ntambirechi and uh, uh, Father Adolf. Yes, Father Adolf. We have a prayer, we dedicate, we bless the foundation and uh, bless everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to thank our presenters, Dr. Jita. Please, Dr. Jita, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Otim and your uh, gracious wife and uh, daughter, apologize to your wife and daughter that we kept you here too long. But uh, a man that moves with his wife and family is a man on the proper move. I uh, want to thank Toro Kingdom. Thank you very much for hosting UPU all these years. And if we go by the talk and spirit, we might land a chunk of land from the wonderful kingdom. The Chancellor, thank you very much. Dr. Karema, thank you. Uh, I don't know if your contacts in Chuba are still there. We am sure people may want to go and see where the prison where you picked Professor Ntambirechi. Uh, Honorable Alex Runda, uh, family members, uh, Barbara, the Vice Chancellor, each one of us in your individual capacity. You are winners and you have helped us have a fantastic day. We hope to come back here. Graduation is on Saturday. Those of you who can stay around, please uh, come. Please come. We may not be as lucky as today for a white package, but it doesn't hurt you to come and see many people in one place once again. I thank you, and my name is Dennis Lukaya. I sign off now. Bye. After the prayer, we'll have, I think, the the anthem. Do we sing Uganda at this time? In the, everything in reverse order. Um, he had East Africa. You have it, Mr. DJ? So we shall do reverse order from uh, U, U, UPU, Toro, East Africa, then Uganda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jenny Mas is back home. Before we stand up for the prayer, one of the many attributes attributed to Professor John Tandruwechi, he was a lover of God. He feared God. And as the Bible teaches us, fear of God is the first stage of wisdom. When we were talking about the anthem of the university, he chose a church anthem. And when I have been researching about anthems, mottos of universities, I don't know if some of you have, have not found a university with a church anthem, apart from Uganda Pentecostal University. And when you go to his office, which now Professor Perse occupies, he has the crucifix there, even in his house. He was God-fearing. And we started the journey of the university together. I prayed many times with him. We prayed in the university. And he installed me as the religious leader of the university. Can't you clap for me? For the university anthem, we shall take all the two stanzas. The others will direct me, those who will lead them. So let us continue to glorify God and to bless God. I want, we can't thank God enough. I continue to thank Him for your presence here, for the brains that have been here all that have been prepared, all that ha has been discussed, God has been working and is still co working through you and he will continue to work through you to build this university, to build this foundation. So the inauguration of Professor John Tandruwechi Foundation with Professor John Tandruwechi Memorial Lecture we all, all this give, give glory back to God. 
And when God is our beginning, our continuation, we cannot fail. For that matter, I request all of us to stand up and I give you a blessing in the name of the Almighty God. The Lord be with you. After every stanza, you will respond, Amen. May God be above you to bless you. With a big Amen. May God be above you to bless you. May he be beneath you to support you. May he be on your side to take hold of you. May he be in front of you to guide you. May he be behind you to protect you from all the dangers you don't see. May he be within you to give you his spirit and make you move wherever he wants you to go. May he always be near you to fight wars that you cannot fight and win by your own powers. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Blessed assurance Oh, what a fortress of glory divine Hair of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior, the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture, the best on my side. And just descending. Bring from above a cause of mercy. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank <laughs> you.